Um, uh, welcome back to Brampton's uh, budget committee meeting, our ongoing meeting we've had for the last week, and we are into week two, which was hopefully where it's going to uh, conclude. We're hoping to have the budget ratification on Wednesday. Over to the clerk to conduct roll call. So members of committee, I will be calling your name. Uh, please indicate your presence. Councillor Santos. Hello. Thank you. Councillor Visante. Good morning. Thank you. Councillor Willens. Good morning. Thank you. Councillor Pileschi. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Councillor Bowman. Present. Thank you. Councillor Medeiros. Good morning. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Hi, and good morning. Thank you. Councillor Fortini. Councillor Fortini. I'll come back to you. Uh, Councillor Singh, I see that you've just joined. If we can just test your audio, please. I'm on. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. I'm here, and I want to wish everybody a happy group group today. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Brown is present. Councillor Fortini. Councillor Fortini did join the call. I did do an audio Good morning. Check. Good morning. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Mayor, all 11 members of Budget Committee are present. Okay, wonderful. So this takes us to um, today's agenda. We have two deputations. Um, do, do I have Council's uh, willingness to hear the deputations first, and then we can move on to um, any motions, and, um, and uh, I believe there's one from Councillor Dillon, and then we can deal with the remaining... Uh, three presentations. Hearing no objections then um, to the clerk, can we start with the two deputations? Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes we can. Um, Jot Vinder Sodi from the Homeowners Welfare As Association um, has uh, requested to delegate. He has not joined the session at the moment, so I suggest we go to the next delegation, which would, is uh, Rick Treadwell, and I believe it's Rosemary Miller on behalf of the Brampton Tennis Club regarding the installation of a winter tennis bubble uh, at the Brampton Tennis Club at Rosalie Park. And Rick and Rosemary, I'm going to bring you into the session now. You can unmute your microphone and it's your discretion if you wish to use your video to address the committee and you have five minutes. So you can unmute your mic and please proceed. So you can go ahead, Rick. I'll assist you and I'll, I'll unmute your mic. Go ahead, Rick. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to this presentation. My name is Rick Treadwell. I'm the uh, city liaison for the Brampton Tennis Club. Uh, the Brampton Tennis Club, as many of you know, is a, a hundred year old summer tennis facility in Brampton with a great history of supporting the community through its numerous volunteer activities for both local, provincial, and national events. Its membership is composed of a combination of young and old who are all very active in all parts of tennis. This deputation today is to put forward uh, covering our clay courts, which would provide us with the opportunity to provide this kind of commitment year round. Presently, as you know, we have one indoor tennis facility, the Chinkozi Indoor Tennis Facility in Brampton, that under normal circumstances is very busy and often is unavailable due to the great demand for court time. Also for the tennis purist, ten uh, Chinkozi has hard courts, which are not always conducive to play that is easy on the knees and the legs for our older players, who then choose not to play during the winter season. The Brampton Tennis Club, on the other hand, has clay courts, which are much easier to play on and that cause less stress on the legs. In fact, in a recent club membership survey, the clay courts were the number one reason players chose to play at the Brampton Tennis Club. Now, because of our location in the new Riverwalk area of downtown, the club attracts people to the city core, but only during the summer. Covering our courts in the winter would bring our members to the center of our city year round. The recent success on the world stage by our young tennis stars like Bianca Andreescu and Dennis Shapovala has sparked great interest among our youth who have now have nowhere to learn the game year round. 
bubbling our facility would provide a place for year round training in our sport. Because the city already has a winter tennis facility, the implementation of a winter facility at the Brampton Tennis Club would be easily managed as the city already has the infrastructure, the technology, the staff and the management in place to operate such a facility. On a larger scale, both the Ontario Tennis Association and Tennis Canada are looking for more winter facilities to support their programs. And the location of our facility near the Aviva Centre would be very attractive to both those organizations. Presently, my role in the club is liaison, liaising with the city and overseeing the installation of our new clubhouse, which will happen next spring. Bubbling our courts would make much better year round use of our clubhouse. If you are able to find funds for the installation of bubbles at the Brampton Tennis Club, the installation of the new clubhouse could be modified to include access points and management areas for winter tennis. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thanks, okay. Peter. Uh, thank you. I, I believe they said Rosemary Miller was there as well. Um, does Rosemary have anything to add as well? But I don't have anything specific to add, but I thank you, Rick, for doing a great job of representing uh, our favorite sport. And I extend a thank you as well to uh, City Council for allowing us to come onto the agenda quite quick, quickly and also for their support of our sport throughout the years. Many of our members are several, I should say, are members of the Brampton Sports Hall of Fame. And um, we continue to work very, very hard to further the sport and to also, in this particular case, to join with the city of Brampton in its vision for the downtown. The short term is looking good, but the long term vision regarding Riverwalk and other facilities is certainly very attractive to everyone. Thanks again, but I really have nothing to add. Rick did a great job. Well, um, if um, I believe there are uh, two questions that I, I, I want to start off with a, a pretty hard hitting question um, directly to Rosemary. Um, if it's such a beautiful sport, and I do believe it's a beautiful sport, um, how come you've not been able to convince uh, Terry Miller to be a regular at the tennis club? Uh, um, we take great interest in the activities of, of the former councillor. <laughs> Thank you. He did belong a few times, but he had bad knees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you for your interest. Really too much well, on our courts. <laughs> well, I, I would note that clay courts would be better for Terry's knees, uh, but, but but I will relent in my my tough questioning. Uh, Councilor oh, Majeros, <laughs> Councilor oh, Majeros is up first. Thank you very much for you, Mayor. And uh, full disclosure, I was a, a member for five years, and I haven't been the last couple of years, admittedly. So, um, you know, I, I have. Uh, uh, a lot of support for this organization. I love uh, the work that they do. I, I know how uh, it meets a, a huge need, especially on uh, this uh, side of the Bram of Brampton. Uh, um, you know, and, and it's it's really true that you see all ages really participate. My question goes to, I guess, Matthew. In terms of, uh, can you speak to sort of uh, you? You talked about the need uh, in terms of Chinkuzi, uh, um, how it gets really overbooked and so on. So you're pretty confident that a bubble, uh, that majority of your members would probably uh, continue and uh, uh, and uh, join. And uh, uh, do you imagine? So if I'm understanding correctly, that this would, uh, the Brampton would run a portion of it, and there would be sort of. Down, there would be times just for the club, uh, like certain hours just for club members, and the other time it would be open to the public, similar to way it works. Is that, is that what I understand? Yeah. If, if can I respond to that? It's Rick Treadwell. All right, go ahead, Rick. Yeah. Um, and the, and first of all, the Chinkuzi Center is very, very busy. I'm actually part of a committee that's been assessing the seasonal bookings at Chinkuzi, and we're stopping those uh, ultimately because the courts are so heavily booked. It's very hard to reserve courts at, at any time during the winter. Um, but I do know that a lot of the Brampton tennis players won't play there in the winter because of the hard courts. So I think that it would bring them back. I think too that that uh, the way they run the Chinkuzi system, you don't have to be a member. You can be just anyone from the city uh, can just call in and book a court. Uh, the, the advantage to being a member is that it, uh, it saves you on your court costs over the winter. So 
uh, it, I would assume we'd, we'd set it up the same way um, and potentially we could have the same number of courts. We could have six clay courts uh, indoors at the Brampton Tennis Club. Uh, okay, thank you. And, and I guess my question to staff with uh, putting a bubble there and that's supposed to be where we're doing river walk, like how is it something that's easy to sort of put up and take down? Uh, I, I, I think it, it is relatively, but if staff can maybe comment. Through the through you, Mr. Mayor, this is uh, Derek speaking. Thanks for the question, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, we'd have to assess um, the feasibility of doing uh, six courts at that facility. With any bubble structure, you have to put down a grade B, so there is some construction. We'd have to look at the servicing um, uh, around there to make sure and all the clearances required. Um, we, with the river walk to your question, one of the things that we've done with the club and working with Rick, and thank you for your presentation today, Rick, is we've the new clubhouse that the Brampton Tennis Club is getting is a modular clubhouse, which allows us in the future to uh, relocate the clubhouse as well. So any investment at this site, we have to take a look to your point, Councillor Maderos, about the investment versus what's going to happen with the river walk, because we do anticipate the river walk um, affecting this site at some point. Okay, thank, thank you, Derek. And and I guess today, uh, the um, I guess the, the delegation, they're looking... Uh, what would you need from us, Derek, today? I'm happy to move sort of referral to staff to report back. Is that what we're looking for today? Uh, and I do know the mayor is a member as well, so I, and, and I see Councillor Santos, and that's technically her area, so I'll let them move in and support it. Uh, but uh, I, I thank you very much. I'm fully supportive of looking at this and uh, notwithstanding uh, um, what comes back in terms of costing or so on. I just know, for example, you mentioned the Chimpuzi. I myself can't get court time. It's almost impossible uh, to get court time. And I think uh, uh, it's just another sort of offering uh, in our downtown area. Uh, uh, and especially, you know, uh, uh, Councillor Bowen and myself always, uh, you know, technically it's not in our areas, but it's uh, sort of closer uh, to uh, Ward 3 and 4 than uh, going all the way to the other across the city. So uh, highly supportive, and I thank you very much, and I'll wait to see what the other uh, delegations say. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, Count Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Medeiros. Um, I was gonna ask the similar questions with respect to the Riverwalk, uh, as well as the proximate cost for um, a bubble. Um, just a question to, to the delegation. I know that we did approve the budget for the, um, the modular uh, new clubhouse to be built. And, and when Council Vicente and I toured uh, the clubhouse last summer, um, I think you guys were almost ready to go to get that up and running. Do you have a stat, can, what's the status of the, the building of the clubhouse there and to to Derek's point or Commissioner, Acting Commissioner Boise's point, um, it's modular so we could pick it up and, and move it if there are implications to the river walk. But ju just the status on how that project is going. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Santos. So um, I would have to uh, check with our colleagues in uh, building design and construction. The city is responsible for building the, the clubhouse. So we're working we need to work with that. With COVID, I think everything has been delayed. So I can uh, work with Commissioner Holmes to get an update to uh, Council on the clubhouse. Awesome. Thank you. And then um, uh, as Council Medeiros had, sec uh, had suggested, the the clubhouse is in, is in wards 1 and 5. Uh, but that's okay. Council Medeiros sounds like he's been in conversations uh, with the tennis club. So you could go ahead and, and move the motion to suggest that we go back and get more information on um, and how on the feasibility of, of the bubble and any risks associated with the, the river walk as well as a, a potential cost. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Next up, we have Councillor um, Durpreet to Dillon. Oh no, that's for speaking after the delegations are done, sorry. Um, Councillor Fertini. Councillor Fertini? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, I couldn't get on. Uh, just a quick question to staff. So when we're looking at these bubbles and or the, the tennis courts, I've been at Chinkuzi, uh 
tennis uh, there many times, and I hear a lot of complaints the way the courts are done. Uh, they're behind each other so lengthwise and they're having a lot of issues. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, you know, maybe they could work with these uh, the tennis people and see how they can make the tennis courts a little bit better for them because I see them when I was out there. It's, I, I understand what they're saying. I'm not a tennis player myself, but it, it, it's a distraction and the way the ball's played, they should be width-wise, not long-wise. That's all I'm asking. Just have to work with them. Okay, and I'm also full of support of it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, um, thank you, uh, uh, Councilor Bertini. I would ask, I know Rick Treadwell wants to speak again, but I would ask one one question myself. Um, it, it's it's a beautiful sport that you can play it at all ages. And one of the things I love, you know, going by Shinkuzi or, or the Brampton Tennis Club is you see, seniors out and active and this is entirely consistent with our 521 agenda to create active lifestyles it is a sport you can play at any ages one thing that i was disappointed to hear is i was speaking to the head tennis professional at brampton tennis club Char charles gambis who is very well known and respected within tennis canada and i understand that a lot of brampton kids a lot of brampton children in the winter because there's not court time available have yeah. to train in Orangeville um, and the notion that our kids have to go to a municipality that's far away to get court time um, is not what you'd expect from a, a city with the recreational assets that Brampton has. And so, Rick, um, should we be concerned that, that, that kids who want to learn um, the sport, who want to lead active lifestyles, have to go outside the city to get court time in the winter? Yes, am I on? Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely, Mayor. I, I agree with you. I've been at the club for 35 years, and over those years, I've seen a number of very good young tennis players come along, but when they get reasonably good, they disappear from the club to get uh, higher-level training at other areas. And it, it has always bothered me that we weren't able to take those players all the way to the top. Charles is a good example of one. Uh, but we've had many top players in Canada who started our club but did not uh, stay at our club because they needed to get the higher level of training that's available in other areas. But, but Rick, I understand not just for um, emerging um, a talent, but, but just for kids learning the, the, the sport for the first time, that, that right now if you need winter lessons for beginners, um, I know that's a service that – Charles, even though he's a Brampton, a downtown Brampton resident, says that he, they have to offer now in in Orangeville. And, and so have you heard that as well, that, that kids in Brampton have to go outside the city for, for winter lessons? Yes, you're absolutely right, Mayor. And in fact, if you uh, go over and visit Chinkuzi during the winter sessions, they do not have group sessions, which is what you need. You need group sessions for beginning tennis players so that they not only learn how to play the game, but they learn... Uh, who the people are at their level so that they can get, then go and experiment with their game, playing against people of, of their own ability. Um, most of the lessons that you see at Chinkuzi are individual lessons for higher level uh, players. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, is there any final, I've got a note here from the clerk that you may want to respond to the previous comment, but, but before we move on from this delegation, um, was there a final comment you'd like to make? No, I was just going to give uh, an update since I deal very closely with Dave Cooper, who's managing the, the new clubhouse. I know what the timelines are for the new clubhouse, and uh, there was a question about where we are in that process. Okay, uh, please please share. Basically, uh, during the month of, of November, December, they have been looking at the uh, basic structure of the clubhouse and the architecture of the clubhouse, designing it. Uh, the intention is then to come in and they'll have to lay a pad uh, where the new clubhouse is going to go. That would probably be done in uh, the late winter, early spring. Once the pad is installed, probably by April, uh, they start building the clubhouse off-site and the intention is to have the clubhouse placed on the pad by the end of June. And, and Dave has been very insistent that they will have the clubhouse in place by the end of June. Great. Well, thank you very much, Rick and Rosemary, for your um, presentation. Um, and uh, I believe uh, there's a motion 
from Councilor Medeiros to refer this to um, staff to report back to Council on the feasibility of uh, this um, initiative. Um, uh, are there any, is there any opposition to that motion? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, Peter, do we have Jovinder Sodi on the line yet? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, Jotvinder has just joined. I'm just gonna bring him into the session. And Jotvinder, welcome. We are just going to bring up your presentation momentarily, and then you have five minutes to address the committee. Yes, well, Jovinder, it would not be a budget session without a presentation from you. So welcome to our city budget uh, committee uh, presentations. And it's good to have homeowners, welfare association, concerned residents of Brampton, here for their delegation. Uh, thank you, Mayor and the Council members. Thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to present our viewpoint, Homeowners Welfare Association and Concerned Resident of Brampton, which has not been a joke in the Saudi. It's a, a combination of the people from all walks of life who are really concerned about the Brampton and its well-being. And it has to be recognized as one of the best cities, not one of the worst ones and we need to change the perception of outside people as well as with all, within the Brampton itself to the mindset by actions not by the words so our action so our request is can you go to the next slide please yes Brampton taxpayers are desperate in need of tax freeze and thank you very much for last two years having frozen the taxes and same time, there are a few other concerns we will not bring it up, like for the penalties and tickets and so on and so forth at this point. And due to the pandemic crisis, the residents of Brampton are in deep financial and emotional stress. This, I stress the word financial and emotional stress. We need a support from the city. Yes, we fully understand that the, uh, the federal government and the provincial government has been providing funding as they come to the Brampton and the region to support the residents, business owners, taxpayers, uh, all walks of people who live and work or do business in this city. We request our mayor, <laughs> Patrick Brown, and six of the regional councillors to lobby with the region to freeze the regional tax increase as well. So this is another humble request. We understand that uh, Patrick and the team is working very hard to freeze the taxes, but we are requesting further, if you could take an initiative and have a dialogue with the, uh, for the Caledon, town of Caledon and Mississauga to do the same as Brampton in Peel region. Please go for the next slide. Um, we, we also, we are looking for, because uh, the, the city of Brampton has some funding for rainy days. I think this is one of the rainy days when uh, pandemic at peak back again and businesses, uh, property owners all suffer due to almost we are in a lockdown situation, uh, all suffering a lot. So we are looking forward if city at its own, either giving them a tax break, or some kind of business incentive at city level, when the federal and provincial funding coming in, that's one part. But it's city at its own funding resources, if and also we are looking forward if city can initiate some kind of uh, like say in a lockdown, curb pickups and other things happening to the business owners. But they don't have a website. They don't have other resources to go to the mass people the way the big box stores have a privilege. They have a, a trust built up with the consumer and customer, so they put online orders. So for that, we need to do a brainstorm, find a solution for small businesses. They could compete them in the same way. And the next slide, please. Uh, crime, I have to bring the crime because this is a, uh, one of the biggest challenge Brampton is carrying, which might have been holding the businesses and the industry to come in Brampton. This could be one of the roadblocks along with the transit and infrastructure, but crime is, is a prime most. Due to the recent increase in crime in Brampton, which we see the statistics of Brampton is in desperate 
need of a police station or police presence presence due to on east side east, northeast side northwest side at 20 more than 20 23 to 27 kilometers away from the Bramley city center police station we appreciate you have given an police station to downtown Brampton understand might be a need might be the different reasons but we cannot neglect Brampton northeast northwest which has contributed per household almost double the taxes we contribute compared to the, the downtown per house uh, tap property taxes please go for the next slide transit we have been lobbying for since long time uh, on highway 7 students international students domestic students university students uh, because all the colleges universities are in mostly in downtown or in waterloo or in um, hamilton because brampton do not have its own university students has to study my two children one is in hamilton daughter and my son is in toronto study we contribute taxes i work in a different city my wife works in a different city so on, this is the unfortunate part part of brampton we're looking forward uh, to have a rapid transit which is the cheapest and easiest solution for the employees also who have done the graduations double graduations have a financial degree have a healthcare or or it industry they all work in downtown or waterloo so we need a transit connection on highway 7 as well as north south on ontario street a rapid transit if when, when you build your rlt fine till then we needed a solution for the students who wait five four five six buses to take their turn to come to brampton this is a winter i believe we all understand and I, I request that even our mayor and council members please do visit those roads and see how people feel cold for hours and hours waiting for the bus their turn because rapid uh, especially the pandemic social distancing will add more trouble to the conditions we had it last year so next slide please Employment opportunities, we discuss about it too, as well as Brampton residents reserve employment opportunities locally on a similar platform as surrounding cities. Surrounding cities are such as Marco, Vaughan, Mississauga, Richmond, Toronto, Caledon, developing employment base at a faster pace. And Brampton needs to learn and apply proven techniques instead of zoning changes. So I will bring up two points here. One is what the, these town cities and the uh, Caledon town is doing differently to bring the businesses in highway 50 uh, on <clears throat> one side we see 10 days later i go i see 10 15 new buildings are constructed same thing in mississauga happening same thing on mayfield border on Caledon side happening same thing richmond markham is happening there is something different our council members are going to India, Turkey, different countries at taxpayers' money to bring the business in. I think we need to look back. We need to uh, breathe in and see what we are doing differently from other cities, towns who are developing at a faster pace. And we request you to please look into this prospect because all of us works outside the Brampton and we contribute taxes. We need a Brampton to be a a hub of industry business not the other cities even i always bring it up a costco in east side is out of brampton and unfortunately we buy including my family shopping over there because this is the closest proximity so highway uh, uh, highway seven and gore a couple of years back it's unfortunate the city said we could not bring the business industry on this 25 acres of land. So we are transferring to the housing. So I will bring two more uh, points in this, uh, adding up quickly. Uh, Cottrell and McQueen. The original zoning was for Plaza. Now it's a condo building. Um, this Javinder, I, I just, Javinder, I just want to inform my clerk that we are, we are two minutes long. So if I could just get you to... Use the next 10 seconds to wrap up. Yes, please. These are the two important points. Mayfield and McQueen and Cottrell and McQueen. These are zoning changes has been happening. 
we're going to revolt with the city. Whoever, councillor, please listen carefully. We're going to lobby to extreme if you change the zoning. We are not threatening. We are requesting to look at the city perspective, look at the residents' perspective, not look at the developers' perspective. The last slide, I think uh, it's uh, uh, closing remarks, please. Is there last slide, please? Yes, thank you very much, Patrick Brown, a mayor of Brampton, very active person, and the council team, Harkira Singh, um, uh, Gurpreet, and everyone, Pat Fatini also had a touch base with us. We're looking forward to working with the city on all those issues, lobby with them, not go against each other. Let's work together, collaboratively, make our Brampton one of the best cities. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I would note, Javinder, in terms of the, the planning issues you raised, there will be opportunities at planning committee to delegate to those. This is a budget committee meeting, so it's a little bit different. Um, but I, I know um, you're passionate about that planning issue, and there'll be lots of opportunities for you to advocate on that issue as well. We have a number of speakers who would like to speak to this. The first one is Councillor Singh. Yes, please. Harkirat, can you hear us? Sorry, I'm sorry. I quit. sorry, I didn't have my cell phone. Can we go back to the slide about crime, please? Crime. Yeah, so thank you for um, sharing this. And uh, I just want to confirm with you that we have been working uh, closely when I say we, myself and Councillor Dillon and the mayor <coughs> to um, uh, get something in uh, in Brampton East. We actually had also a meeting uh, set up to um, uh, go through Gore Meadows and see potentially where we can look at um, doing some sort of uh, community station or, or, or a station, you know, near Gore Meadows. Uh, so then COVID hit. So obviously that had to get canceled. Um, but I know individually, I know um, uh, myself, Councilor Dillon and Pat, uh, Mayor Brown have been having conversations with the chief, with the various uh, superintendents. We used to have Rod Rose there, who was amazing. We have Navi Gingerji, who also knows about this. Um, the police chair also knows about this. Um, but maybe because uh, we haven't actually ever had uh, formal uh, direction, um, if I could just uh, move a motion and uh, uh, Councilor Dillon, if he wants to second it. Uh, to have staff work uh, more in a formal uh, setting to uh, try to get something for uh, Brampton East, uh, whether it's a community station or whatnot. Um, so that's <clears throat> a referral back to staff uh, that's focused particularly on uh, the police station. Uh, and Joe Twinder, maybe you could speak how important it is for the community there. Definitely, definitely. It's very important for our community because uh, Brampton... Uh, uh, northeast and Brampton uh, West also because we live in Brampton we need to be fair and transparent accountable to everyone is desperately in need because uh, robberies daylight robberies breaking in the houses and stealing the cars is normal I think if this is a state area Brampton East specifically is a state area there there is more chances that, that, that they see this as an opportunity those uh, criminals as an opportunity, we will definitely work with our federal and provincial partners to to have a, a stricter laws for violation of uh, drink and drive or these criminals to be curb them, have them in the jail. We understand there is a cost associated, but uh, there is nothing over the safety of the people who contribute, who, who live in this Brampton. Sure. And, uh, you know, I'm, we're, I'm not looking to get it done per se. I'm looking for uh, more of a report to see if there's a way forward. Um, but obviously, you know, some research uh, and uh, some conversations uh, more through a formal structure um, might uh, help land something for the residents of wards 9 and 10 and 7 and 8. Um, I'm not saying it is going to get done, but uh, it's just uh, good to have. Uh, those sort of conversations uh, with formal direction uh, with all my colleagues supporting uh, across Brampton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, sorry, Councillor uh, Singh, for your uh, advocacy. We Mayor have a long list of speakers right Council. here. Um, and so I'm going to go through the list of speakers. Dillon, so we have you on the list, Councillor Dillon, but we have Councillor Medeiros before you. Uh, 
Thank you, Mayor Brown. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, allow Councillor Dil uh, Councillor Dillon to go uh, before me as as okay. there. Councillor Dillon. Yeah, sorry, it's just a, a request, Councillor Singh. We had uh, sent a uh, formal. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, we can. Oh, sorry, Mayor Brown. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, please. Councillor Dillon, can you hear right, us? I'm... Yeah, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yep. Oh, so it's just uh, I had uh, um, uh, just to Councillor Singh, if you don't mind, I'd already sent a motion to um, uh, written up with statistics as well. We had uh, uh, the full motion written up, uh, ready to go for um, the clerk. We had sent it in. So if you don't mind, if we're, we can move that, to, we can move it together. Um, but it was ready to go, the motion, for something uh, similar to what you had said, but we also had a, a associated statistics and slides ready to go. Oh, sorry, was I on that? I, I didn't know that. Yeah, we just we just had uh, mailed it in uh, this morning, just previous to the, uh, just uh, previous to uh, the meeting, and so, so what we can do is we can go over that motion yourself, myself. Uh, we could both move that motion. Okay. All right. I'm okay with that. Then um, you want to move it now because it's relevant to um, this yeah. delegation. Yeah, yeah. 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 We can move yeah. it forward. Okay. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah. Mr. Clerk, can you put the uh, motion and some of those statistics on the floor? Uh, sorry, on the screen, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, we'll bring it up. So Charlotte has just put the motion up. And Charlotte, can you also <coughs> open the PDF that Councillor Dillon just emailed uh, as background regarding this motion? It should be in the email. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just uh, speak to it. We've done uh, quite a considerable amount of uh, research uh, on this issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we speak to the lack of fairness that our, our city receives when we I talk about represent, representation at the regional council or the immense lack of underfunding that our Brampton residents receive from the province in terms of health care. Um, today, uh, you know, Councillor uh, myself, uh, Councillor Fertini, Councillor Singh, uh, as the uh, representatives from Ward 7, 8, sorry, 8, 9, and 10, we come to ask for the same fairness uh, for wards which make up East Brampton where there are no police stations, uh, community police stations or even a satellite office uh, where police officers can at minimum uh, come and file paperwork, rest, use the washroom uh, and be on call to react to the next crime that happens in the vicinity. And so what we're asking for your, so we're asking for your support today and adding police presence uh, in the east end of Brampton. And so, um, uh, Mr. Faye, if you can just put up that first, uh, that first uh, page to that uh, first slide rather. So there's a, uh, in the PDF we'd sent, so there's approximately 200,000 people that live in these wards, eight, nine, and 10, and they represent 33% of the population. Uh, and without question, we have, I would say the most requests for increased police presence, um, particularly to having some, some sort of uh, police footprint in these wards over the last few years. Uh, we've had dozens of community meetings, town halls, uh, where we've had uh, councillors, mayors, and the police chiefs attend. And I want to thank Mr. Sodi and residents like Azad Gouet, who've delegated a number of times as well. And so if you take a look at, at some of these statistics, Ward 8 alone, crimes against uh, a person increased by 52%, crimes against property increased by 19% from 24 to 2018, and Ward 9, uh, crimes against a person increased by 53%, crimes against property increased by 52%, and in Ward 10, Crimes against a person increased by 46%. Uh, crimes against uh, property increased by 31%. So if you average it out, it's about a 50% uh, against people and about, you know, about 33%, 34% against property. And so we pay uh, high taxes in our end. Some of these houses in, in Ward 10 pay $50,000 and plus a year uh, in taxes. And we have a, a large number of seniors. We have a a high number of youth uh, who are, you know, wondering why they're not allowed to have the same protection uh, other communities have. And I've already connected with Peel Police. Uh, they said they'll eventually have a new complete division somewhere in the north, but they can't be certain exactly when 
uh, they we, they can work with us. Sorry, when they're going to have it, but uh, they can work with us if we provide them a space uh, as per them. And so the motion asks for uh, partnering with Peel Regional Police and adding uh, either a community police station or a satellite location uh, to provide a, a police presence in a ward so that we can improve community safety. And so answering the call from our residents to improve the quality of life, reduce their anxiety and reduce their fear, uh, and to provide them with a safe, uh, the same access to safety and quality uh, of service that other uh, residents in Brampton have. And so uh, the request uh, from uh, you know myself, Councillor Singh, Councillor Patini is a pretty simple one. Uh, let's not leave the 200,000 uh, residents of Wards 8, uh, 9, and 10 behind, and we're hoping uh, you guys can support the motion today. And so um, I'll just read the motion out for you now real quick, if you can put that up, um, uh, Mr. Fay. Charlotte, can you scroll to the top of the right. motion so the councillor can introduce it? Thank you. Yeah. So it says, uh, whereas Peel Regional Police plays a critical role in safety and well-being of Brampton's residents, in other words, the city of Brampton has been a strong advocate for fairness and representation at the region and to the province for health care and funding, whereas there is a disproportionate representation of a police footprint within the wards in our city, whereas all other ward pairings in the city except wards 9 and 10 have direct access to some sort of police station, whereas the east end of Brampton comprising of uh, Ward 8, 9, and 10, there are approximately 200,000 residents making up 33% of the city's population. Whereas from 2014 to 2018, crimes against the person in east end wards have increased on average by 50%, while crimes against property increased by 34%, whereas residents from these neighborhoods are experiencing anxiety and fear due to increased crime, lack of police station, and, sev and severely delayed response times. Whereas there have been numerous community organized meetings and town halls attended by the councillors, mayors, and police chiefs advocating for greater police presence, where there's been increasing demand for a police station in the east end of Brampton, um, whereas there are no police stations east of Torbrum Road, whereas it currently takes approximately 23 minutes to drive, 19 kilometers to drive to the northeast end of Brampton from 21 Division. Uh, whereas Brampton City Council has made it unequivocally clear that the safety and well-being of all its residents is a priority. Therefore, we resolve that the mayor and the council send a letter to Peel Regional Police requesting uh, a community or satellite office in Brampton, uh, Brampton's East, sorry, for all reasons outlined, and that staff be directed to identify and uh, identify a location and cost for uh, a potential community station or satellite office in Brampton's East End. So we've already had a, a discussion with uh, uh, some of our uh, members of the senior police team. We've had discussion with um, uh, city staff as well. And so when we're, when we're, what we're essentially asking for is something from uh, one of our city facilities uh, that can accommodate uh, a community police station would be uh, amazing. But even if it's something like a satellite office where uh, the police officers can come, they can do their paperwork, if they have to use the bathroom, they can use it, they can rest, but they'll be in a situation in a position where uh, they're already located uh, in the east end uh, in close proximity. And so if there's a call, uh, they'll be able to react quickly and attend uh, the scene quickly. And so that's the request today, and the, and the motion is on the screen. Uh, and all, at the end of the day, we're just asking for, uh, you know, the same fairness that we're requesting province of the region and that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, people have been to the meetings that uh, Mr. Sodi or Mr. Uh, Goet have organized. There's usually hundreds of people there. And so uh, we're looking for your uh, request today. And so uh, this will be moved by myself uh, and then uh, uh, Councillor Singh and uh, Councillor Patini as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Councillor Dillon, for the well thought out motion with lots of stats. I would encourage um, Councillor Dillon to also put this motion forward at the regional um, council. I have um, I have uh, had the chance to speak to the chief about this, and he said a motion from Brampton City Council would be considered friendly advice, but a motion at the regional council that was passed would be something he would feel compelled to um, incorporate. Um, and so I think this is a great start. And if we, if, we, if we could get this motion brought up for the regional council as well, I think that would be very, very good. Um, so the next speaker on the list is um, Councilor Medeiros. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think uh, all my questions uh, have been addressed uh, in this motion. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next question is um, Councillor Pelleshi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the delegation. Happy to move receive the delegations um, and uh, support this motion. I think this is, you know, going back to what uh, Council supported by way of the motion to have the uh, community safety one-on-ones, the workshop. I think coming out of the workshop, I wanted to ultimately achieve strong, stronger advocation um, from the city to other uh, levels in terms of community safety. So this is exactly the, in, in that step, uh, in that direction. Um, I know that uh, it was Chief Evans, and then once Chief Nish was uh, um, was hired, uh, they all they always talked about having in uh, in Brampton West. So um, still, I, I, from my understanding, they fully support. That's where the next division will be going. But um, if you look at you know, Bram East and the fact that a lot of this information, like um, the stations, no stations east of program um, in terms of the community stations is, is something that you know the city deserves and the city should have so thank you to the area councillors for uh, recognizing this bringing this forward and the delegates for uh, uh, for once again coming here and, and putting a spot on the Bram East Bram West thank you Mr. Mayor thank you um, Councillor Pileshi next question is Councillor Fertini Hey, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I want to thank Capreet Dillon. We were talking about this the last three weeks about this motion. Uh, you know, I, I think Ward 7 is okay because we have the police station right there. And we were talking maybe uh, at the end of Ward 8 or the beginning of Ward 9. That way it catches all three wards for this police station. And yes, that's a great point. We have to bring this at the region. But I also, I remember going back, there used to be a poor police station up at, uh, I think it's Ward 9, on the north of Bavarian and Torbram, which has been removed. And there was also one on the west end, like, uh, and that's been removed. So due to Councillor Pileshi, safety, and uh, also uh, Councillor Dillon, maybe we could put an amendment to have an also one on the west side in Ward uh, 6 or Ward 2. Because really, if you look at the distance between our 21 division or 22, the west side is not served the same. So we could look at two locations one in Ward 9, 10, and 8, anywhere in that area, and one on the west side for Ward 2 and 6. That's I'd like to add an amendment if the councillor Dillon's okay with it. And Mr. Mayor, as the, as the yeah, Ward okay Councillor, me. Uh, <clears throat> councillor Dillon, are you okay with that friendly amendment? Uh, is Well, if, if Councillor Pelesci and Willens are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. So well, thank you, Councillor uh, Dillon. Excuse Mr. me. Mr. May I say something? Mayor Brown, may I speak? Yes, yes. Councillor Pelleshi. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Brown. So I think the amendment can can just go to the to the effect that um, uh, both Chief Evans and uh, Chief Nish have uh, always stated the next division of of the region appeal should be in the in the northwest end. So if we can maybe uh, elaborate on that as the amendment. So, uh, sorry, if I may jump in, um, this is uh, um, just after some, some second thought, this is for uh, the east end, um, this particular motion, and, and perhaps if we can immediately after this move something for the west end, um, just so we have, we're, we're specific um, and, and not to cloudy uh, what we're speaking about. And so immediately after, you know, Council Pleasure, if you want to move this exact same motion, but for the West End, I think that might be uh, good, but uh, uh, because this is just the uh, East End uh, we're speaking about, it, it might be best not to, to cloud it, but like I said, immediately yeah. after this, let's, let's move something else. For, for the yeah, you know what, uh, Councillor Dillon, I, I, I tend to agree with you on, on that because all the stats and the whereases support your resolution. What I'm going to suggest is that Councillor Pileshi, if you can um, take some time, because we've got, we've got, we can put this motion forward any at any time. Um, get those quotes you have from Chief Nish and uh, former Chief Evans, and, and and the crime statistics like have been included, um, and then do one that you and you and um, Councillor Willens could put forward for for the West End. 
Um, but uh, otherwise, it would look confusing to have 90% of the motion reference stats in the east end and then um, uh, have um, uh, um, that added on at the at the end. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I completely agree with that. And, and we're talking about two different things. We're talking about a community station um, as opposed to a, a division. So 100% thank you, uh, Councillor Dillon, for allowing me. Uh, thank you, for <laughs> Councillor Fortino, Fortini, for adding it allowing it and then bringing it out to have it as a, as a separate motion. So I'm fine to work with uh, Councillor Willens on that and bring that forward later on today. Thank you, Mr. Okay, um, Councillor Williams. Hi, yes, thank you. Through the mayor, um, uh, Mr. Sodhi, thank you for coming and delegating and, um, you know, uh, really speaking your voice and using your voice to advocate for the needs of, of the community and I really appreciate your inclusive nature you always say representing all residents in in the areas that you, you speak of and all over Brampton so I really do appreciate that inclusive nature that you present um, I fully support this motion um, this this is a really great step in the direction to help our residents feel more um, safe and, and and increase that sense of security that is needed in Ward 8. Um, because we have the police station 21 division, they are very active and it's such a large expansive area, 7, 8, 9, 10, to have to cover, especially even when you're looking at traffic um, and they, they have usually a shift, six to seven um, police officers for the whole um, shift to be able to manage the, the volume of, of calls that come in. So, you know, having this touchdown space, a space that has a, a front facing presence, I think will be very helpful, not just for the police, but also for the community. So I fully support this. I just have a question to the movers of the motion. Is there a place in there for um, some sort of delegation to the police board? Um, would it be helpful to be in front of them or would I have a letter of that? Suffice. Can I speak? Um, Councillor Williams, um, I would suggest a motion at regional council is something that the chief said he would um, uh, take uh, as a responsibility to follow. Um, and so I think that's where a delegation should go to regional council. Um, and uh, we, um, there'll be lots of opportunities for that. And maybe that could coincide with Councillor Dillon's motion. Okay, that's great. Uh, any way to be in front of all of the faces that make those decisions um, to see something like this happen, I think would be is is going to be very helpful. Um, and also, I would really like to bring this motion and and let the community the. the um, committee members for the Community Safety Advisory Committee aware of this. I know it's um, something that the residents in that quadrant um, have been talking about as well. So I think this is a really great step. I would be happy to second this motion as well, because um, I, I think it's extremely important that we see something like this happen. So um, I would really like to add my name as a seconder as well. But thank you so much um, that for bringing this forward. It's a great motion and I fully support it. Okay, um, next question is from Councillor Santos. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I support this motion as well. Um, I just wanted to be very clear to folks listening as well as residents um, who are out there in terms of the jurisdiction, and this, I, I guess, is a question, um, I guess it would be for, for staff. The, the downtown police satellite virtual office, that is something that the Peel Regional Police had budgeted for and they are the ones who are operating it. Um, in terms of the possibility for these uh, future locations, just some clarity in terms of jurisdiction. Like, it's fine if, if we at the city are able to find a location similar to how we found a location in downtown Brampton, but if Peel Regional Police don't budget for this, um, I, I don't think we'd be able to make this happen. So just, I just want to be very clear in terms of what mandate and, and jurisdiction um, this is that has uh, authority over something like this so that residents 
and Mr. Sodi, who delegated, is very clear as to what this motion is about. We can push for it at the Peel Region budget. We can push for it at Peel Regional Police budget. Um, but if they don't budget for it, we won't be able to get it. So if somebody can provide that clear clarification, that would be great. Yeah, and uh, Councillor Santos, I'm happy to provide that clarification. This would be an advocacy motion. It is not a budget motion. For it to be a budget motion, it would have to happen at regional council. Um, but I believe Councillor Dillon is doing this to build support for a motion that will come at regional council because the city of Brampton doesn't have jurisdiction over the police budget. It's the region of Peel that does. So I view this as an advocacy motion. And we've done advocacy motions on other issues that relate to the provincial or federal government. Um, and that's why I think this is uh, germane because it's uh, it's an advocacy motion on an important issue. Uh, next, you, question, next question is actually the mover himself, Councillor Dillon. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, I, the conversations I had with, um, and I'm hopeful this, um, uh, you know, the discussions can evolve after this and I, because it's such an important issue. And so uh, the, the, the motion itself and the discussions I had with um, with some of the, the senior members was that if the city can provide a space. Uh, and so if we can kind of move um, uh, forward in, in, in the city being able to provide a space as well, uh, whether it's Gore Meadows or whether it's Ebenezer, you know, maybe Derek can speak a little bit more to that, or maybe it's somewhere else. Um, but if we were to find out what those costs would be uh, to uh, the city, uh, and obviously speaking with the, the Peel Regional Police as well in terms of uh, them uh, providing their budget, whether it's the staffing or whether it's their equipment or whatever it may be. And so um, hopefully we can we can examine all options. And so... Uh, if this passes today, I'm looking forward, and Derek, maybe you could uh, speak as well, looking to see what facilities we can provide from the city's end, because I know the uh, Peel Regional Police is under some, um, you know, budgetary um, pressures right now as well. Uh, but at the same time, we have to make sure from a city's perspective that we're, um, you know, providing that safety aspect to our residents. And so uh, from the city angle, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see our costs. Uh, what it could be if we were to have it at one of our facilities. But at the same time, what I'll do is bring it uh, to regional council as well uh, and, and let them know. And so, um, Mr. Mayor, maybe perhaps yeah. you could, so, so, um, so, so, maybe so, you so, could kind of so, guide what you think. Yeah, so, so Council Dillon, if I could provide some friendly advice. Um, I do think this is timely. Um, the Peel Police right now are asking for a $16.7 million budget increase for 2021. One of the most significant new expenses that was not previously planned was the Malton station. And so I don't think it's inconsistent for you to make this ask at, at regional um, council. Um, but I would, um, I would say if the goal is to have the city provide space, that's not in the motion. I don't see it in the motion. You may want to add that in the motion that the city um, supplement the regional ask by um, offering um, space to be determined um, in conjunction with the Peel Police. Sure, and, and uh, Mr. Clerk, would you be able to uh, add that in there? Through you, Mr. Mayor, it so could be added to the second clause um, in terms of staff being right. directed to identify a location and costs uh, for potential community station or satellite office in Brampton's East End. Um, and maybe it could be in, um, to be provided to um, the, the police service at no or minimal cost. Is that the intent? I just want to get clarification. Yes, I think that's the intent. Okay. So could you say right. at no so or minimal original, cost? Uh, would it be similar to what's in uh, uh, at Cassie Campbell, something like that, um, where you know obviously it would cut down the cost rather than renting what we had, like a, a unit in a plaza before where we where we had one in Ward Nine. That sounds good. That looks good. Um, and I, I just asked for, there's a clarification requested by Councillor Santos on, um, I believe the police has rented the unit in the downtown. Um, 
Uh, but uh, can someone from city staff answer that question? The downtown substation, is that rented or is it provided for the Peel Police? I, I, I believe it was a lease. Um, through, through the mayor, um, I believe that's the case, so we could double check on that, but that is um, an, an external space, so I believe that would have been that would have been a lease. I can I can double check for you. Sorry, if I if I may jump in one second, um, the what is the to the mayor? What is the motion that we're going to be looking at? at the region, should we forward this to them or should we uh, make some type of separate request? Yeah, I, 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 Council oh, Dillon, what, I, what I'd suggest you do is you put forward a motion requesting um, the police create a, station, a substation in Brampton East and even more persu persuasive, if you could get a member of Mississauga Council to second it, um, that would show that it um, um, has support beyond our own municipality. Um, and then the police would would um, be required to find um, a manner to include that in their budget. Okay, I'll do that for the next meeting. Uh, uh, can, can I just add something quickly? Yes, Councillor Singh. Uh, Councillor Dillon, you want to add something about how actually people have already delegated on this uh, at uh, Peel Regional Police and, and residents have already emailed, so they are aware. So we're not just making this out of council, but actually the police ha does have uh, delegations. I, I know Joel's been already delegated there at uh, the regional police and residents have emailed a lot. So we might want to recognize that as well in the warehouses. Um, yeah, we can. Uh, did we not add that in there? Well, there's been numerous uh, community organized meetings in town halls. Uh, do you want to add delegations to the region yeah. as well in there? Yeah, yeah including yep. from Hoba maybe. One we're talking. Sure, we can we can mention uh, Hova and uh, other um, other community and uh, so what's uh, Mr. Azad Goyet's group? Maybe we can add that in as well because he's been pretty active. Yeah. So I think that's the uh, Vales of that, the, the Vales of Humber. Yep. So the Hova Vales of Humber group um, and a number of other community um, community led groups and community led meetings and town halls. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Blessing, just just trying to trying to help as much as I can here. Um, we're currently in budget, so so this won't go anywhere in what we're dealing with, and we're kind of working on the fly here. Can we maybe stand this down and then bring this to where it should be, maybe committee this week, so then that we well, that way it can be moved properly, and then sent to so, the regional council because as of right now the minutes for this budget meeting don't get approved until what next week so there may be a budget component um if they're including a community space so that's why i'm giving them a little bit of um discretion on this um, absolutely and i understand that but budget does not get approved until after the next regional council meeting so so the they're just minutes as of right now. And, and until we approve the minutes, they don't go there. It doesn't have status until it's no. approved. No, but I, I, I think if this is simply an advocacy point, so Councillor Dillon could mention that this passed in in, in committee when he get when he gives his preamble to his, his regional motion. But I think it would have more support if it if it was passed at committee this week prior to to regional council. That's what I'm trying to say. But 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 this would pass at the at the budget meeting Wednesday night. We have a special meeting in council. Through you, Mr. Mayor, yeah. just to be helpful, uh, if it if this goes through budget committee today, it will go to the special meeting of council on Wednesday, December 9th in the evening. If it if it goes to committee of council this Wednesday as part of its regular meeting, it would go to the regular meeting of city council on Wednesday, December 9th next week. So uh, regardless of which path. Um, it would land at a council meeting next Wednesday. And if we're trying, if what we're trying to do, this coming out of budget today, without it being passed next week, has no status. But at least if it gets passed in committee 
on Wednesday, then it has somewhat of more of a status at committee than budget. These minutes don't get passed until next week. I'm going to ask Councillor Dillon how he'd like to proceed. It's his motion. Just trying to help because I don't believe that we've ever done something like this coming out of budget where we have done something like this coming out of actual committee of council. That's all I'm trying to, I'm trying to help. Yeah. That's all. Hey, Councillor so Dillon? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's important we get this done today. There are some um, budgetary com components to it, uh, and again, we we can mention at the, the regional council that this was uh, passed during this meeting. Okay, um, we have Councillor Santos next on the list. No, Councilor I have Santos. no. For, I, thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. I have I have no further questions. I, I was just typing in the chat box for clarification on timing. Okay, um, so we have um, the motion on the floor, Mr. Mayor. It's Peter, yeah. sorry. Councillor Fortini has put his name on the list. And oh, sorry. The delegate, Jot Vinder Sodi, had requested to uh, to be able to respond to committee, and but that will be a committee decision. Okay, so Councillor Fortini first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Pileshi brings up a good point, but uh, yes, it makes no difference today or that. I did mention uh, to Councillor Dillon, uh, even though we brought it here, this should be at the region, and I think we'll be bringing it over this, this next regional councillor for him to move and meet to second it there and hoping to get support uh, at the region. But uh, uh, like Councilor Pelosi said, the minutes don't get passed either way, but I think if Councilor Dillon wants to keep it here, I'm in favor of it the same way and we'll bring it over to the region our next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, and um, I'll be happy to support this at the region too. I think this is an important um, advocacy piece on a, uh, something that's really needed in Brampton East. So um, and seeing no other questions, we have the motion. Oh, sorry, uh, Jovinder Sodi, do I have committee's um, uh, discretion to give Jovinder uh, an opportunity to have a quick response to this? Sure, yeah, uh, uh, following that, we can just have a, a recorded vote. I think that'd be, uh, okay. be good, thank you. Okay, uh, Jovinder, uh, one minute to you for a uh, rebuttal. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Brown and the council members for your support. That's what we are looking forward. The email I send you as a text message as uh, Mayor Brown, it clearly indicates we are talking about North, uh, Northeast, Northwest Brampton. We are inclusive on entire Brampton. We need a fair share for everyone and really appreciate and thank you very much for the council. We have been doing delegating from last 2015 for 16, 9, uh, 8, 17, 18, 19, even this year, two delegations we did uh, to the police board a delegation on the for the police station as well as to the region of peel which please that will bring up for the regional councils and the mayor to have a discussion on this subject matter we really appreciate the way the positively this council has been looking at it because 2016 backwards our delegations were in the trash bin Thank you. Thank you. So we have the motion on the floor. A recorded vote has been requested. Peter, would you like to conduct the vote? All members, please indicate uh, your support or not for this motion. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Vasante? Yes. Councillor Willens? Sure. Councillor Pileshi? Yes. Councillor Bowman? Yes. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Williams? Yes. Councillor Fortini. Absolutely, yes. Councillor Singh. Yes. Councillor Dillon. Yes. Mayor Brown. Yes. Mr. Mayor, that motion carries unanimously, 11 to 0. The next motion would just be to receive the two delegations heard this morning. Okay, motion moved by Councillor Williams, seconded by Councillor Fortini to receive the, de the deputations. Are there any, any opposition? Hearing none, motion carries. This takes us to committee presentations. 
uh, sorry, uh, departmental presentations. I believe the next one is planning, building, and economic development. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, Richard Ford, the floor is yours. Uh, good Monday morning, Mayor Brown, members of committee, the public, and staff. I'm pleased to share with you some exciting initiatives in community building through our 2021 budget. Next slide, please, Peter. In 2021, we will continue to implement recommendations of the service review to build a culture driven by getting things done. Our framework for change is around people, process, and technology. Under people, ensuring resources are aligned. Under process, ensuring processes are streamlined. And under technology, ensuring we leverage technology to enhance customer experience. So you'll see in, in our budget goals that we want to complete phase three of the Excella program, which is really allowing the residents now to track the status of development approvals where they are. Uh, we want to build a, a live dashboard to track uh, some of our key performance indicators so that we have uh, transparency around uh, how long it takes to get uh, applications completed. We want to coordinate, obviously, provincial and regional transportation planning issues. Uh, we want to enhance uh, mobile technology in the, with our building staff. We want to drive economic growth through business retention, expansion, attraction, and entrepreneurial initiatives. And we want to strengthen the innovation district through a number of partnerships. Next slide, please. Budget drivers, so growth. We've seen a significant uh, building permit activity increase uh, related to two unit dwellings and home renovations. Uh, so with that's uh, putting a bit of a pressure on our group. Um, we've also had higher uh, service level expectations from residents and uh, some increased the development application volumes. Legislative requirements, we continue to address the Bill 108 in terms of the uh, reduced timelines to, uh, to uh, approve uh, applications so that we can uh, avoid the uh, LPAT hearing process. We do look after a number of council priorities um, and we have increased demand for services and technological advances. Next slide, please. So this slide is really the 2021 development charges forecast. So the beginning balance as of June the 30th through to the closing balance. So you'll see that uh, we had $26 million in the beginning and at the end we'll have $33 million. So it's not a significant increase. And what we're looking towards in 2022 and 2023 is understanding the implication of uh, growth and uh, infrastructure costs related to that. Next slide, please. So what you'll see here is residential construction trend, and you'll see in the solid uh, red line a significant uh, increase in uh, the number of permits uh, related to two uh, unit dwellings. Interestingly enough, we've had uh, 153,000 uh, inspection service requests uh, this year at this time compared to 129,000 uh, inspection requests uh, this time last year. And we've also seen uh, a number of pre-consultation applications uh, increased this year compared to last year. So that's a positive sign in the sense of uh, those that want to uh, invest in, in Brampton are starting to make uh, uh, make their moves in terms of uh, looking into the planning process. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of council priorities, I won't hit all of these, but uh, really uh, continuing with the new official plan is critical as well as uh, getting uh, community improvement plans in place, especially with uh, the current economic environment. Uh, under our green initiative, certainly updating the uh, transportation master plan to prioritize active transportation and non-auto modes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we want to implement uh, the active transportation master plan in, in conjunction with uh, Jane's uh, team. Uh, we certainly want to introduce or enhance mobility inspections and under Mosaic, we want to complete uh, and implement the age-friendly strategy. Next slide, please. So operating budget highlights, um, in, in Claire's air, area, she'll continue to uh, focus on the economic recovery strategy, uh, including uh, executing the 2021 foreign direct investment strategy. Uh, she's also, her team is also gonna continue to provide client-centered approach, uh, concierge service to make investments easier, um, um, as well as build capacity within the business community. Next slide, please. And here you'll see the operating budget overview. So you'll see our expenditures are 29.1 million. Uh, in terms of revenues, 60% of uh, our expenditures are covered by uh, fees and 
And it's important to note that 100% of the uh, building expenditures are covered by, uh, uh, by building fees. You'll see that we're looking to uh, add 14 uh, bodies to, to, uh, to the department. So 12 of those are in the building department, again, to address uh, meeting timelines related to second units and home renovations. And one of them is in uh, economic development to, to deal with the foreign direct investment in Nigeria. And one is in uh, the planning shop. Uh, next slide, please. So capital budget highlights. Um, certainly what we want to support uh, Algoma's university's expansion plan. Uh, we want to, in collaboration with Toronto Business Development Centre, uh, establish a soft landing space. So that's the Beehive in the downtown. Continue with active transportation modeling and uh, the transportation master plan implementation. Next slide, please. And you'll see here the two uh, the two largest areas in terms of investments in, in capital is in the economic development. So that's related to commitments around agreements with the various institutions and the other areas in the policy planning shop. So that's related to funds required for the official plan studies for the Heritage Heights uh, secondary plan and a number of other different initiatives that are ongoing uh, this year as well as in 2021. Next slide, please. So I'd like to thank uh, my staff in, in the department they have been great in terms of certainly pivoting around COVID and getting things done. A special thanks to, uh, to Claire Barnett and uh, Bob Bjarke, Rick Kennard, uh, Alan Parsons and uh, Henrik Zoberg and Margaret and uh, Melanie, a great team that I'm working with. So I'm uh, quite pleased to present this uh, budget to you today. And that's it. Thank you for the presentation. I believe we have um, the first question is Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just I just said that uh, I have a declared conflict in economic development, so we can't talk about the grant funding. Um, but uh, stop me if I'm if I'm uh, going into that sort of area. I'm just inquiring about uh, the funding for Beehive. Um, that's not uh, that's not part of our grant funding program, is it? Um, Claire, Claire's on the line and she can explain uh, where the funding source is coming for that. Good morning and thank you for the question. No, it is not coming from the grant funding. Okay, and we've got 2.1 million forecasted for this year and a million forecasted for next year, correct? That's correct. And do we have a, do we have a commitment for that already? I'm like not assigned, sure. assigned commitment? No, we are currently negotiating the um, agreement with the service provider. Okay, I, and the reason I'm asking, Claire, I'm just I'm, I'm just looking at this and, and thinking, you know, this is this is a program that is is going to be put in place to bring foreign entrepreneurs into the city uh, through 2021, and I'm just, you know, for me personally, I'm wondering if we don't have enough businesses that have gone out of business in this city now that may go out of business over the next four months, if somehow that money might be better spent on local entrepreneurs, local business people that have gone out of business to get them back into business, to get them back as being entrepreneurs because they were entrepreneurs and that's why they had a business to begin with. So, um, um, Councillor Councillor Bowman, I might be able to help here. Um, yeah. To to Miss Barnett, is this is this a grant or is it a loan? The um, service provider agreement is neither a grant nor a loan. It is money that is going to the economic development uh, department um, in order to um, pay for fit up costs and some of the agreement with the service provider. Um, because at the end of the day, this money will be returned to the city through the startups that are paying for the services and for the uh, co-working space. So that and is, so, um, yeah. sorry, and, go ahead. I was going to say, so to Councillor Bowman, um, the relevancy here is the, the Toronto Visa Development um, Centre um, was located in, in the tech sector in Toronto. And as part of their agreement for issuing startup visas with the federal government, um, the, the startup has to agree to, to show they've got money in the bank to pay for rent. So this is not subs this is not subsidizing or providing funds to a business. They come here under the federal government startup visa and they pay 
for the rent. They pay. So Brampton, Brampton is not subsidizing these businesses. Brampton will actually be getting revenue from these businesses. And because the rent has become so expensive in downtown Toronto, it's why Brampton was viewed as an attractive choice because our average rent is less. And I would note this organization that has, that does the startup visas for the government of Canada was just included in the provincial budget um, as a priority for economic development. So we actually got really lucky here that we're going to be able to get these startups um, uh, with with funding and 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 are going to hire people um, to be in in Brampton. And so the, so I think what we're doing and Claire, correct me if I'm wrong, we're we're refurbishing a place a, a space so that we can take these new um, startups into our city. And where are these startups coming from, Patrick? All over the world, or Mr. Mayor, sorry, all over yeah, the world? It could, it, they could come from all over the world if they're approved from the government of Canada for a startup visa, which means they have to have a successful business. Um, and the reason we were excited about that is it means that's jobs for Bramptonians. Okay, I, and, and, and the, the rent is not subsidized. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm just looking at this from a standpoint of, I know this budget is not based on on either pre-COVID or post-COVID activity, but I don't believe that, and, and it's just me again, um, I don't believe that we will be ready to get this up and running under trying to get Brampton up um, economically and back to work um, until very late next year. So my point is, I'm just wondering whether this 2 million 100,000, and, and again, there's no guarantee that we're going to get this money back from um, these entrepreneurs that come here. It's it's not a guarantee. We're planning on getting the money back. No, no, actually. So, so Councillor Bowman, they don't get issued the startup visa unless they can show they can pay their their rent. And so it is a it is a guarantee in terms of the ability to 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 rent the space. And and what I suggest, if anyone curious about this, go take a look at the space in Toronto to see that it's at capacity with with local job creators. And so um, it's been a really interesting concept. I think that's why the provincial and federal governments have have really put an emphasis on this. Okay, well, I'll, I'll wait to hear what everybody else says, but you know, I, I'm just looking at it and saying, I don't think that's an expense that we need in our 2021 budget. It's probably more of a 2022 budget, but um, I'll, I'll wait till I'll hear whatever everybody else has to say. Thanks. Um, Councillor Willens. No, sorry, uh, Mayor. I'm um, before. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Medeiros. I missed you there. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, to I guess uh, to Richard. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, the presentation and uh, really, um, you know, and, and, and I know maybe uh, because uh, uh, being the chair of the department or of the area that I might have some you know insights and. Uh, you know, you guys keep me more abreast on, on all the activity, but in just terms of all the work that you guys have been doing all out, you know, down from, you know, yourself to, uh, to everyone, uh, Alan, uh, to Rick, uh, to everyone's, uh, you guys have just done a fantastic work and, and kept things really going uh, during COVID. And that's the type of feedback I've been hearing from uh, stakeholders, from everyone involved. So uh, way to go. Now, in terms of uh, the the budget specifically in the asset positions. So those 12 positions that are going to, um, you talked about renovations and secondary units. Uh, so I, uh, just more specific. So I guess, is it to help do more inspections? Is it help to process more uh, sort of the, the paperwork and all that stuff? So through the, through, uh, through the chair, I'll, I'll let uh, Rick speak to it, but gen the general, the General answer is yes, but there's some specifics that Rick can certainly provide in terms of the nuances of what staff will be doing. Great. Thank you, Richard. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to Council Madero. So uh, to answer your question, the the bodies that we've asked for are, are spread out across uh, the division, uh, and they are both to assist in the processing times of, of the applications and to assist in inspection. Uh, but more so at the moment, uh, our backlog is really with, with the processing of the applications. The, the volume of uh, unit applications that we received is very similar to uh, where we used to be, you know, five years ago, six years ago with, with uh, the subdivision housing. 
uh, but our subdivision housing process is very well established. We've got we've got a, a great sort of by model program, uh, and we can deal with volume uh, in that respect much simpler than we can in the second units. Uh, second units, every application that comes in is is individual. Uh, it's very unique. It, it, it often is being handled by the homeowner themselves, so somebody's not necessarily experienced in, in the process. Whereas when we're dealing with the homeowner or with the uh, professional builders, of course, we've got the certified model program for a subdivision of you know 300 lots. We typically have 50 models uh, that get cycled through the subdivision. Uh, and so, so volume in that respect isn't uh, representative of the work in the same fashion that the second unit's applications are. As I said, there's much more time that has to be spent. So the majority of our, our uh, ask for, for bodies in 2021 is for processing of the applications. And uh, that includes uh, a body in the permit application, uh, permit positions, I think uh, five bodies in, in plan uh, scattered throughout the uh, division, but focused on uh, processing the second unit of home renovation. Now, thank you, Rick. Now, and, and just uh, for sort of my knowledge, the, the type of people that we're getting, so when you talk about processing, uh, I think there needs to be appreciation. It's just not getting sort of anyone off the street. These are people that have certain qualifications and skill sets uh, that you're looking for. Is that correct? That is correct. We, um, we generally require a, a three-year uh, diploma from a post-secondary institution, either in civil engineering or architectural engineering technology. Uh, but beyond that, we also, uh, the building code requires that you have specific uh, ministry qualifications. Uh, and what that means is you have to write exams with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, proving your knowledge of the Ontario building code. And that's not something that, that most people have. It's very specific to this industry. And, uh, and so the candidate pool, when we're, when we're looking at hiring, is, is very limited. Uh, we're typically hiring or Know, coaching staff from other municipalities, or we are hiring um, people that are within our own department into uh, higher levels of position. Then, so often, what happens? Uh, to give you an example: is we'll hire somebody that doesn't have the full qualifications as a customer service plan examiner. Uh, we give them a period of time to get the qualifications, and then, of course, when there's an opening, you know, in plans review, they jump into that uh, position and we're back building customer. Often to, to fill uh, to fill one of these roles often takes several months uh, of, of hiring process. No, that's that's great. Thank you, Rick. So that it's it's just an important appreciation that. Um, again, when we talk about talent management and, and getting staff into the city, we always uh, talk about trying to get the most qualified and highly skilled. And, and your department certainly can't uh, uh, succumb to uh, uh, anything uh, less than uh, highly skilled people, specifically uh, from the industry. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, so my last question, and again, I uh, apologize, Richard, and I think that goes through you to clear. Um, everything was going good, but my, my ears perked when I heard uh, a full body, a new position, just to focus on Nigeria or an investment attraction. Did I hear correctly? And maybe clear, you can speak to this. Sure. Um, the position um, is to work um, to hire somebody with experience in that market. So it would be Africa and the Caribbean um, to attract foreign investment to also work with businesses um, that are in Brampton, but are headquartered in those various countries to ensure that they stay in Brampton and grow uh, and increase their presence in Brampton, and also to attract entrepreneurs from those countries. So we do have um, a connection and are also a lot of work that has been done with Nigeria. So that would be predominantly the first country um, that we will look at building a market strategy for. However, also Kenya. Kenya has a massive tech cl cluster that has been developing, um, noticing that many American multinationals are now investing there and are now supporting their startups to bring them back to the US. And also in the Caribbean, there is a huge effort on startups and entrepreneurs from the Caribbean who are looking to become much more international and are looking to North America. Uh, and so that is an active marketplace for us as well. So thank you, Claire. So when we talk about this is for Africa in the Caribbean, so it's one position, 
uh, I had understood that it was only for one country, but this is for uh, broad base and, and really there's a rationale considering the diaspora and uh, some of the activity. So that is correct, right? Someone really who knows those markets in general. Absolutely, we um, we do need people who have the relationships, have the connections, have the knowledge and the experience in markets around the world, and specifically for this conversation from Africa and the Caribbean. It's really important that we understand that culture. Okay, now, and I guess just in terms of the area, when you talk about, I guess with this COVID, uh, uh, and I know that there's been sort of, uh, in terms of the activity, so a person brought in, knows the market and so on, so I guess, uh, notwithstanding uh, relationships in person that this person would still be able to sort of work on these markets, I guess electronically setting up meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going, there's going to be activity because my, the, the question is if you can speak to the urgency, why now and not next year, considering that it's COVID? Uh, why now? Um, I think that falls too much of the work we are doing for foreign and direct investment attraction. So it's important to note that- no, no investment attraction doesn't just mean um, new investment it also means retaining the investment coming from these countries and growing the investment of businesses we already have so when we have been doing our virtual foreign direct investment attraction uh, missions um, they have also included um, meetings with companies who um, already have a presence in brampton or in the region that we want to ensure that um, they grow so that is a huge amount of our work right now. It is all virtual, so it's a really great way for us to be able to uh, test different conferences, to set up corporate calls, to work with the hosts in those markets. So it's a really great time for us ha when not having to travel. We can we can do substantial amount of work to lay the groundwork for when we can travel. Okay, no, that's great. I, re I really appreciate it. And I think, um, not to specifically look at this one, but just across the board to all departments, and the, this is a, maybe a message to the CEO, that all the positions that we're bringing forward, there has to be some productivity returns on this and, and return on investment. So, you know, you look at the building department, really makes sense. You look at what you've just explained, you know, on board and, and makes sense. And, and you know, so simply just uh, approving uh, administrative positions where productivity is not contributing for, you know, either the city to enhance its position uh, from an economic base or, or uh, trying to get return on investment because uh, I won't be supporting any sort of uh, other type of positions uh, going forward. But I thank you very much for this. And then uh, thank you again, Richard, to uh, you and your team. Like this department has really, uh, uh, from what I've got here back in 2014, where we are now and what we hear in the community, really fantastic work. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Councillor Medeiros, uh, for those um, questions. And I believe this um, relates to a motion that was passed by Council a few months ago as well on our Black Economic Development. Um, uh, now I see the next on our list is Councillor Willens. Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess this is to Claire. Um, mostly in regards, regards to the Beehive, um, I have similar questions and concerns that Councillor Bowman uh, had, as well as Councillor Madero's good catch on that one job there. Um, I think you've answered most of the questions. I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, are we going to be able to get do the work to retrofit the spaces next year in, in case this COVID does keep going, continue on well into next year? Are we going to be able to get the things and get the off or get the, get the space, I guess, ready and renovated for, for this for this um, project? And the other thing is this, will there be green tech jobs? And would this also include Aboriginal entrepreneurs under the BI? Um, in terms of the question about the space, yes, we're doing very minimal um, um, fit up for the space um, to um, ensure that we don't don't put um, a large budget um, or expenditures into that space. So we have been looking at existing furniture. We are um, not doing uh, many renovations to the space. So we are really very, very aware of ensuring that the costs are quite low. So therefore, um, it will be up and running um, quite soon, actually in, in uh, the first quarter of um, uh, 2021. Um, and so we certainly have um, budget in mind when we're doing that work. We also are, ex are following all of the um, uh, visa applications and, and keeping an eye on 
when can that um, operation begin? Right now, it's really laying the groundwork. So for the next six months, it takes about six months for a startup visa application to be approved. So um, it is quite amount of work that needs to go before those companies would even come to the city. So in terms of the question, um, can this be delayed um, or can this be moved to the next year? It's really the work that needs to be done now in order to ensure that we do have it post COVID. We have those companies coming in. To your question about sectors, um, this is absolutely open to all sectors. We are focusing um, clearly on our sectors of strength and the, that would be technology and tech enabled businesses. Um, and so that would include green tech as well. And one thing I could help with, uh, Councillor Willens, I've, I've forwarded this to all members of council um, from the provincial budget because this this investment helps us to track the, that provincial and federal investment. The federal government regulates the startup visas, but on page 121 of this year's Ontario budget, attracting startups to um, Ontario, the province will provide 3.75 million over two years to support the work by Ontario Centres of Excellence and the Toronto Business Development Centre. So our partners with the Toronto Business Development Centre. So they have two locations, one now in Toronto, which is at capacity, the second one being in Brampton. And the mandate the province has written is to attract more international startups to Ontario. Both these organizations have long-standing track records of supporting high growth firms across the province, leveraging their experience with commercialization. These two organizations will initially focus on attracting emerging companies from India to expand their operations across Ontario and to create new jobs for local workers. As a result, Ontario will expand its relationship with key emerging market economies, which will help to facilitate increased trade and help increase the pace of innovation in Ontario's economy. And so the goal is local employment, as you can see in the mandate. So it's getting companies that have to hire and finding them space to commercialize in Ontario. Does that help, Councillor Wallace? Well, that specifically speaks to one country, but I guess it does help. Um, yeah, so Claire, um, you've answered the concerns about, so the space, you need this year, you need next year to get the space ready for this program, because you did say it, it probably six months, it's probably gonna take longer than six months because of COVID, so I'm okay with that. Um, is there an opportunity for uh, the original entrepreneurs, or is that, would that fall under some other type of program, because this is more ge geared towards international? Um, this project is geared towards international, however, um, those would be served through any of our partners in the innovation uh, district, so uh, the Entrepreneur Centre um, or any of the Ryerson uh, pro projects, for example, and um, Algoma. Algoma, um, with um, their focus and their presence in the north, obviously, would, would be working with um, that community as well. So. Um, if that is something that is provided as direction for economic development, we could absolutely start doing a more concerted effort to attract startups from that community. And, um, and Councillor Willens, one question you asked is about environmental technology. I know just from the briefing that, that Claire and myself got, um, one of the companies um, that's seeking a, a startup visa um, turns algae into biodegradable plastic. And so we talk about not using single-use plastics. They're working on an alternative that can meet the, the Government of Canada's new mandate on that. Um, so there are a number of environmental startups as well. This is not limited to um, tech startups. Okay, thank you. I think uh, between yourself and Claire, I think you've answered uh, my questions. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, Councillor Pileshi. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Mr. Mayor, and uh, some some really good questions. Um, I guess uh, first off, I'd, um, Africa as as the continent has has uh, just over I think fifty four countries, so a huge opportunity to to reach out to to all of those countries and and others in the Caribbean as well. Um, <clears throat> I know that there's a lot of there's a lot of environmental uh, technology um, uh, startups and institutions actually coming out of out of the continent. Um, so I, I look forward to, you know, hopefully having some of those um, incorporated into this into this startup visa. But also maybe there, th this is an opportunity for uh, uh, Claire and, and Councillor Vincente and I to, to kind of take back some of these questions um, to, 
to say at our next maybe economic development um, uh, task force meeting to look at opportunities to uh, put together something to bring back to council to let council know you know what we're currently doing um, <clears throat> for businesses uh, just in Brampton alone and then more of uh, more of some more information on uh, on on beehive as well and opportunities for the uh, indigenous communities I think this is a, a, a huge opportunity uh, as per uh, councillor Williams just speaking to it I think there's there's a great opportunity to uh, to try and highlight that. Claire, is that something that we can maybe add to our, our next task force meeting? Sure, very happy to. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Councillor Plushy. That covers all the questions for planning, building, and economic development. Um, Peter, do we need any motion to receive this report or do we do it at the end? Through you, Mr. Mayor, we'll do them as a group after all the departmental presentations. Okay, so this takes us to our next departmental presentation, which is legislative services. Well, that's great. Thank you, Mayor. It's uh, David Barrick here um, serving as Acting Legislative Services Commissioner. I'll be presenting the Legislative Services 2021 Proposed Operating Capital Budgets. I will say, though, that uh, as this council is aware, there's an incredible team in legislative services. Um, the city clerk's office led by Peter Fay, legal services led by Samir Akhtar, court administration led by Jane Yakabuchi, risk and insurance led by Deb Chacona, bylaw enforcement led by Paul Morrison, and animal services led by Kathy Duncan. I believe they're all on the call today as well when we get to the questions uh, section. Next slide, Peter. So the budget goals for, for this group uh, really is the commitment to, to continue to provide strategic support and advice to the internal departments, as well as our residents on matters related to community safety, animal wel welfare, prosecutorial and court operations, <coughs> legislative compliance, risk management, city governance and records management. The intent is to streamline and continue to streamline business processes to increase operational efficiency uh, as we have been doing, invest in enforcement and prosecutions to improve public safety through achieving compliance with uh, which this council is well aware, certainly during the pandemic. Next slide, Peter. Some of the budget drivers as referenced, uh, certainly uh, the, the continued growth alone uh, legislative requirements continue to change. Provincial downloading changes every year, much more of a hit in 2020, but still uh, an adjustment for 2021. Um, some of council's priorities, an increased demand for services, et cetera. Next slide, Peter. Your term of, cou of council's priorities, one of them uh, certainly is health and healthy and safe. Uh, council may be aware of the continuation of expanding the administrative monetary penalty system or AMPS with the addition of non-parking designated city bylaw to continue to buy, provide uh, education programs through our enforcement team and to continue to address public safety concerns with illegal second units and lodging houses. Next slide. Well run city, uh, part of that is to enhance our corporate enterprise risk management program and identify and mitigate risk. I think there's a, a portion and certainly a conversation of that element with our audit team as well. To continue to support quality service delivery through effective corporate information management program and redefining the role of animal services through providing community-centered animal welfare solutions. Next slide. The operating budget highlight uh, you, you will be able to see is a new revenue of a million dollars in automated speed enforcement um, that this council has been advocates of as well as increase in additional revenues through ceremony uh, fees, um, uh, park it ticket revenue, as well as to increase subdivision agreements and legal services. There are a couple additional staff requests, uh, one in animal services, a civil marriage officiant, and elections coordinator. Next slide. Here you'll see um, the overall team in legislative services is approximately 230 people as such, the bulk of the expenditures, the 33.6 million, is of course staff at 25, about $26 million. Uh, on the other side, however, on the revenue side, you will see that uh, the bulk of the revenue 
is from user fee and service charges and about 9.8 is from the property tax side. Next slide, Peter. On the capital uh, side, in terms of a highlight, there's really a, uh, a plan in place uh, where animal services in collaboration with building design and construction are submitting a request to redevelop the existing animal shelter. So we have in the 2021 budget uh, some money for planning and design and uh, in a future projection the actual construction of what that planning design will look like. Next slide. And here, so you'll see there's about $75,000 of uh, other capital, which is predominantly uh, replacing existing equipment. And next slide, Peter, and I think that concludes the presentation and we're happy to answer any questions from the Legislative Services Group. Okay, I see the first question is Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation, David. Um, just wondering, we've got three hires, one in one in animal services um, and one in officiating um, as well. But the question I have is the amount of work that has been tiling up in terms of illegal second unit investigations, property standards, which I think all councillors are hearing more of lately, uh, not just me, um, and parking on streets, things like that. Um, these guys are our frontline workers as well. And we constantly talk about overloads. We constantly talk about uh, people getting fatigued, uh, overloaded. Um, but we've got no new staff assigned to that particular area for, for bylaw. So I'm just wondering if we've got information on the percentage of increase in the number of calls, for instance, that, that bylaw gets. Uh, compared to last year um, over this year. Do, do we have those? Is Paul on the line? So, sorry, David here. I will I will add, uh, thank you, Councillor Bowman, for the question through you, Mayor. Um, certainly my role as acting, uh, this team that I highlighted at the beginning has has made it easy for me in the acting position. It's a tremendous group. Uh, we, we do have regular conversations and understand as well some of the um, uh, the, the fiscal responsibility that this council wants to continue to demonstrate. Uh, this question that you're asking, Councillor, ha has come up. Um, and uh, so I will pass it to uh, Paul Morrison to help in responding. Thank you. Just before you do that, David, from your from your comments, does that mean we don't need to hire somebody? You're willing to take that over for good? No? <laughs> <laughs> we can come back to that. <laughs> Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I can tell you, uh, Councillor Bowman, that we have had an increase in uh, our parking, our, our complaints in general for enforcement bylaw. I can tell you back in 2015, we had 25,000 complaints. In 2020, we are already at 52,000 complaints, so we've doubled up and we're not done the year. So we will probably end up around 60, 62,000 complaints this year. Um, for municipal enforcement, uh, back in 2016, uh, we had 14, uh, sorry, 4,000 complaints. Uh, this year we had 12,073, so we've uh, tripled up on that number as well. All our numbers, I could go through the whole report, our, all our numbers are going up uh, significantly and steadily. Um, we issued um, in 2015, 65,000 parking uh, offense notices. Last year, we issued uh, just short of 110,000. So we've actually increased our performance in our work there as well. Wow, those are big numbers. Um, Paul, also, when the work of the bylaw officers increases, how does that impact the people who work in our court services? And you're right, it, through you, Mr. Chair, it does have a uh, direct impact on court services in the sense that they process all of our work, our parking tickets, they process um, the uh, summonses and the infractions for secondary units uh, for all the uh, part three summonses. So there is a there is a uh, an opposite uh, reaction there. So. OK, and now we've also got um, I've noticed that we is is there's something changed because i noticed that uh your team does actually make callbacks at some times to uh 
um, to 311 calls or, or to people that we forward to? Has something changed there? Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, I think what you're referring to is the, uh, the callback through 311 when uh, somebody launches a complaint online. Okay. So there's a tick box that never used to be there. So a citizen now can tick the box off and request a follow-up on their complaint. So we probably followed up um, maybe 10, 15 complaints a week uh, under the old process. Now everybody wants to know what happened to their parking complaint call, what happened to their illegal dumping call, et cetera. So we, we do hundreds in, uh, during the week now, maybe two, 300 sometimes on callbacks. So and who does that? Well, we've just taken that duty back over. Uh, we sort of share it among anybody who's in the office, uh, anybody who may be uh, returning to work on a, um, from a sickness or an injury that's on a return to work on a graduated basis. We try to do that. Um, anybody we can fill in on that uh, position. Okay. And when we have uh, some of our bylaw officers parking, are they 24 hours? Our bylaw officers 24, uh, 24 hours in the sense that do do we do we actively go out twenty four hours on shifts? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, well, our structure is uh, four four platoons of ten officers, and they work under a supervisor. They work on a twenty four hour rotational basis. Um, and it's uh, so we'll always have somebody on. That's supplemented by um, now we have six part-time officers who work primarily nights, and they assist on the parking and the signs. Uh, they can't do what a no regular uh, enforcement officer can do, but they can do parking and signs on a part-time basis. So we do have a 24-hour presence uh, for all parking and uh, municipal enforcement offenses. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm just having a little bit of trouble understanding this. I know that I get tons and tons and tons of calls um, about enforcement, about parking violations, illegal second units. Um, and we're doing all of that with, with no real increase in the number of officers that we have, bylaw officers, either part-time or full-time. And we're not adding any um, to the complement here. And the city's gonna be growing. We've already heard from, uh, uh, from Richard's group that the number of um, uh, permits for second units is going way up. Um, and, and I would imagine as the population grows, there's going to be more calls about parking, about driveways, about all the garbage. I'm just wondering why we have no staff requests here. Oh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's, that's the rest of my shoulders that I didn't ask for a staff request. I would look. I was looking at um, improved technology. I was looking at uh, the processes we go through to improve performance, uh, and I also looked at uh, uh, budget year where we have to be very conscious of uh, our additional asks. Uh, where Councillor Medeiros has stated, you know, he will not support uh, uh, something that isn't productive in the sense of either a return of investment or um, a monetary return. So I took all that into consideration, and then I didn't do an ask this year. Okay, um, <laughs> it's very admirable of you, but uh, I, I don't I don't see it that way. Um, I would agree one hundred percent with Councillor Medeiros that we've got to show some return, and uh, through your office, through the bylaw office, um, through Rick's office, we do see a return. We do see a return in revenue. Um, parking tickets have gone up. The number of charges have gone up revenues have gone up for people that we hire the revenue goes up it's not I, i've always referred to these departments not as cost centers but as revenue generators um and I, I i would very much like to see if we've got four shifts running a day and we add one person that is actually a quarter of a person per shift am i correct there you through you mr chair yes and, and I don't think that is anywhere near enough. Um, I'd love to hear what other people say, but again, we keep talking about overloading people. We keep talking about people getting fatigued. Um, and, and I think 
the the bylaw staff and the building staff have done a fantastic job, especially during uh, this COVID crisis and our and our fire department. I can't leave them out. Um, and, and I think it's time that we do add more people to this department in order to make it more efficient, in order to make things go smoother, enable um, callers when they call so they don't have to call me back two days later and say that, you know, the, the car is still parked on the street, for example, and there's been no tickets given. So I, I'll wait to hear what my uh, my fellow councillors say, but I'm uh, I'm looking at this very carefully, and I would I would seriously consider before we finish this budget um, adding people to uh, to your department, Paul. So thank you. I'll wait to hear what other people have to say. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bowman. Next up is I see Councillor Fertini just wanted to, noted that he has a conflict on the bylaws, so he'll not be voting on that position. Um, and then we have Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor. I just want to qualify my response, and I do appreciate everyone who's listening. And I guess what I wanted to articulate is that when I talk about return on investment, I'm not just not talking about financial. You know, when we talk about the the valuable work that your group has done, Paul, and, and I agree 100% with Councillor Bowman. It's also, for example, trying to protect and add to the quality of life we have here in the city. You know, the work that you go out and do, uh, parking standards. So in terms of our sort of core business, I guess what I'm trying to say is I much rather support a, a staff asking your area, which I see uh, uh, what residents want, than someone who is sort of a backdoor position uh, who necessarily doesn't have that impact on sort of our business that we're seeing. So, um, you know, I definitely uh, agree with Councillor Bowman. Uh, maybe you can go and think about it, how we can improve. And, and this is where I think it's up to you uh, to really come back and let us know in terms of adding one or two, whatever positions that you deem necessary, which is gonna help us deal with those calls of overnight parking, uh, investigating illegal uh, basement apartments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I think we always have to sort of look at the type of services that residents want, we have to align it. And certainly if I look at my call uh, load, uh, and it'd be probably interesting that the 311 come back and, and sort of present us some of those stats, I think a high, lot of the sort of calls we're getting really fall under your department. And I know how worked uh, your department is, so I would be fully supportive of uh, something like that. So uh, if you wanna sort of do a rethink on uh, how we can uh, uh, support your department more, uh, and support the uh, bylaw officers and, and look at other areas. So uh, I just want to qualify that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Medeiros. Um, Councillor Williams. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, to Paul, about how many staff would you say? I know um, Councillor Medeiros was saying to go back and take a look at it, but um, if you had an idea of how many staff you think would be beneficial um, to be added to this budget this year. Can do you have any comments on how many? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I can tell you we're well positioned right now for secondary units with the addition of the cannabis unit the, uh, this year. So we're going to move forward for probably a year with that. We're, we're decently positioned in licensing right now, although we are uh, in, uh, in um, we're continuing to look for new uh, um, investigations in the sense of how can we better the uh, the business the business enforcement opportunities we have out there. Where we are weak is a little bit in enforcement. We haven't increased um, our staffing over the uh, years. Uh, I can tell you in 2016, we were around uh, $3 million in parking tickets issued. Uh, in 2019, we're Five million, just short of five million dollars in parking tickets issued. Uh, the CAO sat down with me and he and he uh, allowed me to put forth a pilot project for uh, additional uh, two additional um, part timers to work the evening shifts to assist on the signs and the uh, parking enforcement. But where we've really remained static was the uh, enforcement officers themselves, ten officers, and if you take any any a given night. We will usually have one or two off on holidays or annual leave, maybe one six. So we run pretty much from about 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. with six or seven officers throughout the uh, the uh, whole uh, city of Brampton. If I was to reinforce any area, it would be the uh, enforcement officers for now. And uh, as Councillor Bowman articulated, if I hire four officers, that would be one per shift. 
So that would give me that 24 hour coverage. So I would ask for a minimum of four. And then after that, uh, you know, the luxury would be eight, but the, uh, the, the ask would be four. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Four officers, and um, to me, that is, if that is going to help make your uh, uh, operation run 24 hours and smooth, I think that I would fully support that. And uh, so I know there's some conversations going in the chat, and, and um, Councillor Bowman it will be up next to speak. But um, yeah, I would fully support seeing four officers added. And uh, it, just to echo the same sentiments, um, it, the number of calls are quite high that we're getting. And, and it's usually um, from people saying the car hasn't been moved um, and we need more assistance and so on and so forth. I just wonder the AMPS program that's been added um, has that. How has that impacted the amount of parking um, calls that we're getting in, or and has it been running smoothly enough to see what we're what the projections are going to be for like the next year with regards to um, the parking on streets? So through you, uh, Mr. Chair, the AMPS program has actually been fairly successful for us. We coupled with that that with the new G Technic technology, and we saw a proficiency uh, move from uh, approximately five minutes for a parking ticket issue down to about uh, two two and a half minutes three uh, uh, at the most. So that has been good. The AMPS system has also been good in the sense that the courts administrate the hearing screening officers for that system as well. And Jane has done a wonderful job as as Diana Seuss in streamlining that process, uh, hiring good people over there. So that has become good. Where we're, where we're gonna start seeing benefits is when we bought the G-Tech the system, we allowed for a program called non-parking amps. So all the offenses that property stand, some of the offenses property standards officers issue and some that we issue uh, always had to go to court. This non-parking AMP system is going to allow us to not go to court, and if anybody wants to contest, they go to hearing screen. Quick, much quicker for the uh, citizens of the city to do, much cleaner for the courts to administer, and easier for us to issue the notices for. So we haven't seen the fruits of that labor yet because we just brought it in this year, and we're testing it out this fall through the courts because we have to make sure the hearing screening officers are knowledgeable to hear the offenses. So we've been working through all that. We will see the uh, the payoff of that come in 2021 when we start getting more offenses. Right now, we only have a few. We're going to test out snow clearing uh, this uh, uh, fall, where we used to have to go to your door, knock on the door, give you a notice, give you a couple of days to clear your dry sidewalks. And then if you didn't, then we would clear it or we would take you to court. Well, now we can go to your door, knock on the door, put a penalty notice on your door, and it'll be a warning ticket. And then we can come back with a notice a couple of days later for a fine. And we can also have it clean, cleaned up as well. So it really expedites, makes the uh, pros, whole process more expedient. So we are going to see um, positives come out of it, but not till 221. Wow, that's great. Um, really excited to hear about the, the snow clearing and um, and I'm assuming grass cutting could also be included in that as well? Absolutely it can and that's what we're gearing up for. We just want to make sure we have a solid base to the system before we put it into play. And that includes how, how do we receive the money back from the penalty systems because on parking tickets, it's simply if you don't pay, it goes towards your renewal of your license plate. But we can't do that when it's a property offense because it's not tagged to the license plate. So we have to put it to either the taxes or to a summons uh, server for payment. So there's a few things that are different than the parking piece, but we've worked those out with GTACTA. We've worked it out with finance and we've worked it out with uh, courts and we believe we have a great solution for that. Wow, I'm looking forward to hearing that come forward. So I'm glad you started talking about the, the uh, grass and the snow clearing because, you know, I, a large volume of calls that you've probably um, gotten as well are, are people complaining of 
um, you know, neighbors not clearing their driveway or the grass cutting getting so high and attracting animals and garbage getting stuck in the weeds and so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, with the, the a large amount of people who are calling and complaining about this, it really, it makes me question what are, um, what is it? What, why are we having so many calls? Why are people not willing to take some ownership over their property and, and keep the place, you know, looking clean and also safe for people who are walking through the sidewalks during the winter? And so um, I'm really looking forward to what's going to come out of the reports next year because I wonder if, um, and I know, Paul, we've talked about this before, about, um, you know, how to get the message out there around what the fines are, why you're receiving a fine, what the amount of time is to make sure you have your your lawn cut. I know there's really, you know, some really great communications coming out around the soccer ball and how high your grass needs to be and everything. But is that would ultimately um, encourage people to, I guess, follow the rules and the bylaws that we have and make it make it easier for for your department if people are doing this. But is there is it in your budget for those communication campaigns to get the message out there? Is that also um, a component to um, you know some of the areas that you've addressed here? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, absolutely, Councillor Williams. It's in my budget. Uh, we've been working the last couple of years with uh, Director Tamming and his area over a communication strategy. We've been working with Suda uh, out of that area, and I think we have a very robust strategy. We go out and we do all sorts of uh, media and, uh, uh, interactions. We do interviews. We do pamphlets. Uh, so over the last few years, we've developed that strategy. I think a lot of our complaints are due to the, now the public are aware of what they can complain about and what is uh, expected of our community in the way of standards such as snow and, and, and grass, etc., illegal dumping. So I think a little bit we're our own worst enemy in the sense that we've advertised what services we offer. Now the community is drawing on those services, which is good because ultimately the goal is to make this a very safe and uh, a beautiful community. So we, that's how we approach it. Yes, and we have the money. So what do you think is the barrier to people not clearing their driveway or their sidewalk and cutting their glass? What, are, what do you think are the ultimate barriers to that? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, I can tell you antidotically, a lot of it is people's time. So when we get a lot of people saying, I was going to get to it, I was going to do it, I just didn't have the time. So we see a lot of that. Uh, some of it is their own desire to just let it go, and and if it doesn't affect them, it certainly uh, uh, they don't want to spend money on it, or they don't want to spend the effort on it. Uh, so we get some of that, but we continue to educate the importance of doing it. And you quite rightly brought out earlier. I mean, we have the infestations that could come from long grass. We have the accidents that could come from slippery sidewalks. Those are important things to make sure the public know about, and we try to emphasize that quite a bit. And you guys have been doing a really great job. And so I, I think um, where I'm, I'm wondering is um, around our fines, um, because not trying to say that is a great source of revenue. We don't want to have to issue fines. Nobody likes to issue fines for these things. Um, and we definitely are empathetic to the reasons why some people aren't able to. But for those who just don't really care, and um, and for those who... Um, you know, I know I've I've gotten uh, many calls about landlords who are are not present, and the tenants uh, either don't know what they that they need to be responsible for the property, or they don't have the tools to make sure that they have um, can cut the grass or or shovel the the roads, um, the sidewalk. So, uh, I are our fines um, sufficient in trying to curb the behavior? Do, do you find that they they could benefit from being increased or are they good staying the same this year until we get more of a rollout and how the, the new program's going to look? What are your thoughts on that? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm glad you brought it up, Councillor, because this is the important part of the AMPS program. And this is what we're going to hopefully realize in 2021 is the previous process was sort of a slow process. We had to go, we find your, your, 
the illegal activity, the long grass, the sidewalks, et cetera. And then we take you through the court process quite often. And that could be an 18 month, 18 month journey. So you really didn't learn your lesson very quickly in doing that. The AMPS allows us to ticket immediately, which it has, has impact right away on the person. So if they're not gonna cut the grass, they're not going to have to deal with that a year from now in the way of payment. They're gonna deal with it right then and there. Same with the sidewalk, et cetera, where you know, you're not going to let this go into the summer before you you have to open your wallet or, or you have to take action. You're gonna take action right as soon as we put the penalty notice on the door. And that's when that fine starts. We hope that's the trigger to get people motivated to do what they're supposed to do. Well, that's good to hear. So maybe we can talk about it after we see some of the, um, you know, the the what the the AMPS program, what the new programs are going to produce. I'm really keen on and receiving that data, and um, you know, just to make sure you do have the mechanism to collect that data because I think it's going to be extremely important and helpful for um, next year's budget when we start looking at um, in 2022. So, I. I I would be very happy, Councillor Bowman, to um, support the motion um, if you're going to bring forward for four staff. I think it's going to be extremely helpful and uh, looking forward to seeing what the outcomes will be. So I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. I believe we have a motion coming by from Councillor Bowman, seconded by Councillor Medeiros. Councillor Bowman, would you like to speak to that? Can I speak, Mr. Mayor? I was yeah. on the board before Councilor Bowman. Uh, yes, you are, Councilor Willens. Not to forget about me. Uh, thank you, Paul, for coming forward. That was good. Um, I, I tend to agree with Councilor Bowman and Councilor Medeiros. I think it was Councilor Medeiros uh, said that he's not. It's not really the return of the dollar, but the quality of life. And you have certainly include um, have certainly improved the quality of life in some of the neighborhoods for sure. Up in up in our wards, and, and I know probably throughout the city. So. That's great. So I will wait for Councillor Bowman's uh, motion to come forward to see what he's saying. But uh, another point, um, I didn't see it in here. We can talk probably talk offline more about uh, about this with you and uh, Rick Kennard and maybe Fire. Um, you remember we had that igloo that came and it created situations that may be too expensive or hazardous to create in the real, real world. So basically, in a nutshell, a controlled an environment that you could reduce potential errors or and identify potential issues. Can we look at maybe revisiting that next year? Or and I know COVID was tough, and I think some of the councils may have been a regional council, and that was in the um, in the atrium or not the atrium, but the conservatory at City Hall. Can we relook at that again, maybe for next year, Paul? Because I think that would be it. the the amps and other stuff that you guys have put forward has certainly uh, improved our our bylaw and our building divisions, but. Um, Maybe we can have a look at this again in, in uh, 2021 to see if there's any room in 2022 budget. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Rick may be on the line, but I'm gonna try to answer for him. But Rick and I have been working on a project that will uh, create a building in the infill uh, area between our two buildings. And the igloo is intended to, to be a, 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 an anchor piece of that uh, as a training center, but as an operations center, so we can see all those problems out there. I believe the uh, uh, the timeline is in the next couple of years. We're in the uh, uh, securing uh, the design uh, piece of this for 2021, and hopefully the build falls after that. But Rick may be able to answer better than I. Sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, sorry. There you go, Rick. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alan, and thanks, Paul. Uh, you you are correct. Uh, so we've uh, we've been in conversation with uh, uh, building design and construction just within the last few weeks on the progress, and it looks like uh, the RFP has gone out for the design architect for for that additional space, administrative space between the uh, unit one and unit uh, two at FCC. And as Paul mentioned, the that uh, igloo design, that virtual learning space, is, is included in, within the scope of that project. So, so this year is the uh, the initial design work and, and the uh, engagement with the architect, and I believe there is ask in 2021 for uh, already uh, for the actual construction of of that addition, which would include, as Paul mentioned, uh, that igloo uh, virtual solution as an integral part uh, component of the construction. Okay, that's great. No, thanks very much. I, I wasn't aware of that. That's excellent. Good. I'm, I just thought maybe it got put up on a shelf somewhere. No, that's good. Thanks very much. Okay, next up, Councillor Bowman. Do you have that motion? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would just like to propose a motion 
um, that uh, we come back with an adjusted um, budget allocation of four new full-time staff um, for this area. Um, but I would also like in there, not just the costs, the anticipated revenue that they're gonna bring in um, so that we're not just looking at an increase um, of, of four new officers to the budget. And I believe Councillor Madero sat, wanted to second that motion. So Mayor, it's David here. I just put a note in the um, chat box uh, stating some of the information that Councillor Bowman had just referenced. So our anticipation is the addition of four bylaw FTEs would cost approximately five hundred dollars to six hundred thousand dollars. So about uh, as council saw in the presentation, about two thirds of that would be supported by non-levy uh, revenue. So the levy impact would be approximately one hundred and seventy to two hundred thousand dollars. As referenced, it's not a material amount that could be partially absorbed in operations uh, and or uh, partially through lessening the contribution to reserve so that the additional staff could be added with no no levy to the uh, sorry no impact to the levy. That is absolutely fantastic. So I would like to uh, move a motion to add those four. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion moved by Councillor Bowman, seconded by Councillor Medeiros. Um, and I believe Councillor Medeiros would like to speak to this as well. Oh, actually, am I wrong? Councillor Pelleschi wants to speak next. I have a note here from Peter Fay uh, saying that he's having technical issues. I yes. was having technical issues, but I'm good now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I had to I had to log out, log back in. Um, um, Mr. Morrison, you were talking about um, fines for people uh, not clearing their sidewalks. And um, <clears throat> when before we would give them a notice, now we're saying that we're going to give them um, uh, it's a is a penalty notice. Can you clarify that? Yeah, absolutely. Through uh, you, Mr. Chair. So, Councillor, we we'd issue them a, a penalty notice that uh, um, would include administrative charges for the work we do, citing them that they have to clear the sidewalk. Further to that, Public Works has taken over the uh, portion of ensuring that sidewalk is cleared. So, if they don't clear it then Public Works engages a contractor, comes and clears the sidewalk for them, and then they get that additional charge sent to them as well. So they would get a notice from us for, for having it uh, blocked, and they'd get the bill for having it cleaned on the other side from Public Works if they don't clean it themselves. Okay, so um, I guess how does that relate to now, you know, many many of the, uh, the complaints that I've received any time that we've gone out and 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 charged the homeowner for not clearing the sidewalk. It, it's almost like there was uh, special circumstances. And um, I recall uh, one where um, the person was actually in the hospital for uh, for a number of weeks, wasn't able to to get anybody to to clear their sidewalk. And we always talked about in the past that we would we would work with, try to understand, and have that conversation with people. So how does that then change that ongoing communication education about trying to ensure that, you know, one, ultimately we want the sidewalk to be cleared, but we also understand that, you know, there could be special circumstances, but special situations that that the resident isn't able to do it. What do we do in those circumstances now with this change? Hello? Hi, Paul, did you want me to answer that? Um, anyway, through the mayor, uh, Council Major, um, Council Palacio, when we have, um, when we do receive a complaint and we do go ahead with, um, with the charge, I mean, we do, we do try our best to find out what the mitigating circumstances are ahead of time. I mean, um, and certainly we'll work with, if we do find out something after the fact, or um, then we'll certainly try and work with the resident in terms of, um, you know, being reasonable. I mean, I don't, I don't think we go out there to be mean, um, but we are trying to make sure to the best of our ability that uh, if you are able to clear the sidewalk and that's the responsibility of the homeowner, that they are in fact doing that. Um, 
But in the meantime, if there, like I said, if there is something that comes up that's a, an issue or a mitigating circumstance, we'll certainly try and uh, work with a resident to get it resolved. Okay. Okay. So it, it may it may be changing to the effect that you know before we issue a penalty, um, when when before in the past before we would issue the penalty, we would try and understand. Now we may be trying to work with them after the after the fact. But regardless, we're still trying to work with them. Absolutely, we're trying our okay. best just to make sure that we're being reasonable, Councillor. We're not we're not there to uh, we're not there to be mean. Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I understand that. Um, I guess from you know this one and our, our one and only snowfall that I've that I've seen so far um, that we've all seen, um, we're, like people are going back into the um, a state where there there's a lot of cars and coming out of COVID, we weren't really issuing too many um, uh, parking infractions. I don't believe so. Um, currently what i'm what i saw and just driving around the the areas that uh, that i did after that snowfall um there was a lot of a lot of those you know cutouts where um the the plows had to go around a lot of cars i'm not sure if other members had noticed that after the snowfall but um in the past i've seen you know caledon does a huge social media um campaign on getting cars off of the road and I had already seen them start doing that before I think I saw us start doing that. And I, I, I really believe that we need to get that word out to get people thinking that, hey, you need to get your cars off the road. But also at the region, we should be doing a better job in terms of trying to get the cars off the road for uh, for the times that they're they're picking up the garbage as well. So if, if I can just highlight that. Um, so, Council, so, sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, so, oh, sorry, Paul. Um, through so through the mayor, um, Council Pelleshi, we we do have a great partnership with enforcement. Um, you'll you'll recall that when we did our recent winter maintenance report, uh, we did talk about um, being more proactive in terms of getting those cars off the road. So when we know a snow event is coming, uh, but we work with uh, enforcement to uh, proactively go out there and um, you know start to uh, enforce getting those cars off the road ahead of time. Um, what we have found, and, and you're right, in the last snowfall, it always seems to happen in the first couple of snowfalls where we have to start getting used to winter again. But um, what we found is that with there was more, um, when, there was, when we were able to do that proactively, the complaints that we uh, received last year um, decreased quite a bit. So we're hoping to continue that more in the, in the future. We do have hot spots, if you will, throughout the, um, throughout the city that we do uh, keep enforcement apprised of. And we work in partnership with them so that we can try and get those cars off the road prior to uh, going into snow plowing event. Okay, what I noticed in, in Cal and what they're doing is, is and I don't know if this is a, a bylaw or, or policy that they, what they do is if there's a snow event coming, it's a complete no parking on roads uh, campaign across the municipality. Is that, is, is that something that they have, they have the, um, the authority to do by way of, of uh, whatever bylaw that they've put in place? And do we have the same? Through you, Mr. Chair, Council Pleasure, we have, already have that in place. Uh, so we do have the ability to uh, say no on street parking at all during snow emergencies and uh, severe uh, events. Okay. Um, and then I guess my final question, uh, just with respect to uh, to this motion, if I can, or I, I can I can wait and see when I uh, read the motion, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you want to, I don't know if it's on the floor or not yet. So, Councillor Plessy, can I just finish answering one question you had? When you're talking about the uh, sidewalks not being clear and people not being able to do it, one of the nice things about this system is under the AMPS process, they can now go to a screening hearing officer if they did to get a ticket or something happened, and they can go state their case, which before didn't, didn't have that ability to do. They had to go to court. It was separate. And that could be, like I said, 12 months or later. Now they can go almost relatively soon right after the event and clear that up on, under somebody who's willing to listen. But, okay, so, okay, I understand. Um, 
But what I don't like about that is then I don't want us to be going out and just and just driving down these um, um, uh, these tickets for people uh, and not fully understanding if they're if they're or or working with the residents to ensure that they they know one they have to clear the snow because some residents may be moving out of a municipality into ours that um, um, they have to do that now or or they just didn't have that they didn't have the physical ability to do that so they didn't fully really understand so so if us going to somebody like that that wasn't able to do it and just giving them a ticket now they have to go to court to fight the, fight the ticket oh absolutely but don't forget counselor that we do give them uh, a, a 24 hours sometimes 11 after 11 p.m we look at it but we don't go and look for these events we go based on complaint for the most part and we issue a notice to put it on their door and they do have a period of time to clean it so we give them opportunity to do that without without being fined okay so then um is the uh, mr peter fay is the is the motion on the floor through you mr chair yes councillor bowman did move the motion the one that's on the um, screen in red uh, Mr. Acting Chair, would you like me to yield, or can I talk about the motion now? If the mayor has stepped away, you may talk about the motion. Go ahead, speak to the motion. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Acting Chair. Um, I guess what I what I don't fully understand is is uh, Paul. Maybe you can clarify, and maybe you did when I was having my tech issues. If so, I, I apologize, but. Um, your original submission to to budget uh, wasn't including any additional uh, staff, um, but now we're requesting that you that you look into providing additional um, law enforcement officers. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, yeah, Councilor, you are correct. I didn't do any additional staff asks because of that trying to stay within our realistic budget but uh councillor bowman uh through his questioning asked me and councillor williams asked if i could use more staff and i tried to articulate where i could use that staff okay so maybe i'll yield to if councillor bowman is going to be speaking more to his motion thank you mr uh chair okay thank you do we have any other speakers to this motion yes councillor uh council Medeiros. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Bowman, for uh, bringing it forward. Uh, I guess in terms of the, the fact that we're not going to have a budget impact, that's important because I was going to say to find it within in terms of the other sort of uh, employee asks that we're asking. So I'm good with that component. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I see no further speakers. Mr. Clerk, do we vote on this motion now? Through you, Mr. Chair, you can, yes. Okay, so uh, are any, uh, there's no further questions. Are, is anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, that carries. Thank you. So next, uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, we have, um, do we have any other motions to be moved by members? Mr. Chair, there is one last presentation, the Office for the Chief Administrative Officer. Sorry, Our CEO. Sorry, Paul. Uh, if Mr. Barrick is ready, we can proceed with the next presentation from the Office of the CAO. I, I am, yes. Thank you, Chair. So um, with that, uh, with your leave, I will, I'll get started. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, th this, uh, this is the last one. I, I'm going to speak a, l a little bit about the Office of the CAO itself and then kind of close the loop on a couple of other elements that we've heard up to this point. Um, next slide, please, Peter. So the Office of the CAO, uh, as many may be aware, is predominantly responsible for the strategic direction and, and uh, implementing council's decisions, empowering employees to find opportunities to increase efficiency and effectiveness across organization. Right now, the Office of the CAO includes a corporate projects policy liaise, the internal audit function, as well as organizational performance and strategy. All total, there's approximately 43 staff uh, in the Office of the CAO, which, which again, as we, we noted in previous meetings, is a is a reduction from the former iteration of the office, which had many, uh, many other divisions within it. Next slide, please. So some of the budget goals are, are really uh, 
specific to the Office of the CEO itself, but overarchingly as well, the corporate broad uh, budget, corporate budget that's been brought for you today, uh, working in, in uh, detail with finance staff as well as CLT and all the areas to bring this forward to you. But part of it includes uh, identifying synergies between operating groups and enhancing internal resource collaboration, modernizing corporate policy framework, which is an ongoing piece of work, enhancing diverse, inclusive community engagement, supporting uh, collaboration on the establishment of governance, academic and economic strategies for the Brampton U project uh, resides in the office of the CAO, engage community stakeholders uh, and provide advocacy efforts for the provincial government on Brampton U. The advocacy successes, which we've seen so far, include public transit infrastructure funding and Riverwalk to the tune of over $100 million so far. And refining internal audit methodology, uh, working in tandem with the audit committee. Next slide, please. Uh, again, we've seen uh, the budget drivers here are no different than many other areas, uh, inclusive of some of the council priorities. Uh, we've done the council workshops in the midterm review, and uh, we will have a presentation for you next week, a report to you this week, and a presentation for you next week uh, to have a little more discussion on closing the loop on that aspect of it. Next slide, please. Uh, Timber of Council priorities, once again, uh, this council is well aware. Uh, I don't think I need to go through these. Next slide, please. Some of the highlights, again, monitoring, tracking the term of council priorities we've, we've seen um, uh, and you've seen in the workshop in terms of the status of where we're at with many of those, many of them being uh, predominantly uh, in-house staff led and helping to refine uh, not only what the priorities that are important to you to help drive out front, but also refining the performance measurement process, uh, which is inclusive of COVID-19 dashboard and the development of corporate dashboard uh, that resides in, in, in my office currently overseeing continuous improvement on corporate wide initiatives and continue to, to uh, advance uh, government relations advocacy, which includes as well the anti-black racism unit, diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, an internal audit completed 10 audits in 2020, leading into 2021, 12 full scoped audits are planned. Next slide, please. So the budget overview, overview you can see uh, because of the 43 staff, most of this budget is salaries. A uh, total of 9.6 million all in, uh, which is predominantly funded from from uh, property tax. Uh, no new positions are identified as part of the budget binder that you've received. However, if we lead into the next slide, so uh, here's I want to kind of close the loop on some of the items that we've talked about to date. Uh, some of the items that we've discussed with respect to the midterm review, as I noted. Uh, uh, report, a uh, draft report will be to you by the end of this week for a presentation next week. And we've heard the, for the feedback from the workshop. We've heard feedback from you. Uh, many of those elements, uh, which we'll talk about, some of them are here, but many of the elements include uh, from yourself, fiscal responsibility, competitive tax, which I think this whole budget process and previous ones speak to, active transportation, economic recovery strategy, a customer service engagement, recreation revitalization. These things we can build into our existing work plans and operating functions. However, what you see before you in terms of possible investment and priorities are some other elements we heard from you on, which includes the equity office, the project management office, in this case, center of excellence and capital compliance, as well as community safety. Those things we've heard from you as well from the workshop sessions. And those things we're saying uh, would be helpful to actually be established. One of the best ways to establish these items is in fact through the budget process. And one of the main reasons why uh, we held those workshops when we did. So we could we can have the discussion and put the resources behind it. I would add, as you can see in the slide as I'm speaking, uh, hopefully you can see this slide. Um, with the small amount of assessment growth since the budget binder has been published, uh, which may be about 400,000 and um, insurance savings of about 800,000. That leaves us with an additional funding amount of 1.5 million. 
So I'm going to repeat, there's 1.5 million available from uh, both insurance savings as well as a bump in assessment. In other words, the items on this slide are not levy requests. It's not new money requests. It's room we have existing in the current budget. And some elements uh, that, that I'm suggesting in consultation with staff um, are, are the following. Um, you can see where the budget updates in the room came from, from insurance premium assessment growth. So uh, an equity office, it's about $278,000 there. That would be a one stop for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we know that we have uh, a couple of DE&I folks. We have the Anti-Black Racism and Economic Empowerment Unit. We have ex accessibility uh, folks. We have the, the, the seniors and youth. They're all over the corporation. <laughs> and so um, we're hearing other avenues as well in terms of uh, different uh, uh, portfolios being lifted and, and, and picked and represented. And our, our advice is uh, establishment of an equity office and, and bundle those and, and shared resources all in one place. Um, I, I will state uh, that part of this conversation has been conducted with our union partners and, and our union partners are supportive of the idea of the creation and establishment of an equity office, which I think was very, very important. Another component, uh, which you will hear from KPMG very soon, is the PMO, Project Management Office. In this case, we're, we're suggesting be called predominantly uh, capital compliance. The recommendation through council previously uh, and, and KPMG Capital Project Delivery Review is the establishment of, of this project management office to standardize project delivery processes, closeout procedures, identification and prioritization, and leveraging corporate assets and transparency. This council may recall, uh, in fact, it was this council who, who, who picked KPMG to do the review, um, has seen many, uh, I would say, corporate projects or capital projects, I would say capital projects that have been on the books for many, many years and not closed. So council, you, you've seen that on your own. Uh, there's been some questions there. Uh, there's been a review. There's been some savings realized uh, to the tune of $10 million. There's still some work to be done. Um, KPMG is suggesting, and we fully agree, is to have uh, some dedicated folks to continue to do that work on a regular basis and provide that support uh, across the corporation. Uh, this uh, will do exactly what KPMG is uh, recommending, and I believe what council as well, once again, through the workshops has discussed. A community safety office, we're looking at here uh, really one FTE or manager position um, to focus on community safety issues with an emphasis on resident level engagement. Um, we've talked about many occasions. Um, where does community safety reside? <laughs> you know, is it... Uh, even within the corporation, but also without. Regional appeal, uh, policing, our community partners, nonprofits. Uh, the reality is the city does have a role to play and that is predominantly um, engagement, facilitation, uh, and providing some of those linkages to be responsive. Um, and one aspect to do that is to, you know, have it all in one, one spot as well. And the suggestion of an additional resource to support that aspect. The other piece which we've identified uh, is very helpful, certainly through the pandemic, but also on an ongoing basis, is uh, right now council um, and the mayor have two um, worldwide and citywide communication pieces, newsletters. Um, that level of communication directly from our council and councillors has been proven to be more important through this uh, emergency and pandemic. And, and therefore, we're recommending that that be increased from twice a year to quarterly, so to, from two to four times a year. And that would cost approximately $300,000. Once again, uh, Council, you are our best ambassadors. And so uh, the community outreach aspect as well for additional engagement and support directly from you to the community of about 150000 And the library, you've heard earlier on in this budget process, the library had some additional asks. They total 189,000. We're suggesting can be supported. So all of these things can be supported within the existing budget envelope. This is not a 
ask. <laughs> this is not anything um, that would impact the levy. Uh, this is uh, 1.5 additional savings realized, and we're able to help plug in a lot of the items that we've heard from you in terms of being important. Next slide, please. I would add at this point the consideration of a path to zero. So council in the budget process, I believe it was June or July, stated very clearly to bring back an option to get to zero. Uh, notwithstanding the recommendation is 2%, uh, we would suggest how to get to zero is this. You can see in the slide, and that is the, the lessening of the contribution to reserves um, to get to zero. You'll see in the 2020 budget column, the total contribution to reserves was a record $109 million. We can achieve 0% tax increase and still have 2021 contributions to reserves at 100 and almost $114 million, which is more than 2020, and a new record contribution to reserves and still achieve zero. The 2% currently would, would top those contributions to reserves up to $123 million. And so our context is uh, understanding the fiscal responsibility competitive tax component that council has made uh, important, understanding the, the nature of the pandemic and emergency that residents are facing, that that balance of the $10 million or so is enough of a conversation to say, should we be taxing residents to put money in the city's bank in terms of the reserves? or to achieve zero and still have a record number of contribution to reserves. Next slide, please. You'll see here, um, once again, from 2018, 19, and 20, the total amount of unspent, uncommitted capital balance by year. The Q3 2020, so right now, there's about $688 million unspent, uncommitted capital. With the approval of this budget, even if it's the 0%, in 2021, there would be $820 million, and this is important, unspent and uncommitted capital reserve balance. And you'll see the 2% tax increase would raise it to $830 million, unspent, uncommitted. So this is an important aspect uh, we want to really highlight to your attention in terms of um, the options. The option we are suggesting for council to get to uh, a path to 0% tax increase in 2021. Next slide. Well, that's great. Thank you, uh, council. Um, if you have any questions, we're happy to take them. I know that there's, th this concludes the presentation, but there's a variety of reports forthcoming and happy to answer any questions. Okay, we have a number of questions. Thank you to our CEO for that presentation. Um, I'm looking on the list right here. Um, Peter, see, the first one is... I have Councillor Williams, Councillor Medeiros, Councillor Santos, then Councillor Singh. So Councilor okay, Williams. so Councillor Williams first. Uh, thank you. Through, to the Mayor, um, thank you, David, for the presentation. Um, you know, some really interesting pieces that came out of the investment and priorities um, slide. And just to clarify, that came out of the... Um, workshop that we did and the survey that we completed. Well, thanks, Councillor. Through the Mayor, Peter, perhaps you can put that slide back up. Um, and Councillor Williams, yes. So, so these items came uh, predominantly from the workshop. Exactly that report you'll get later this week, uh, and and a presentation next week on uh, the particular results. Okay. But these um, uh, these elements uh, are from that. Sorry, think, Peter. Oh, yes, sorry. Slide. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Peter. The slide, that's the one. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to get the results of that workshop after we uh, potentially approve this budget, or are we going to get that before? Well, thank you. No, my, my full intent is so you have all the information up front. Um, so because of the timeliness of agendas, you would, you would actually receive the information uh, first, uh, so this week, and then... Yeah, this week, um, okay. Yeah, so you'll receive it this week and then getting the consultant to come and uh, do the presentation to you next week. Um, so you'll have it, you'll have it again next week. 
the final approval of this budget is later on the that evening. So there's still some time and opportunity. Okay, um, great, great to see equity office on there. Um, you know. We, I know it's something that has been bounced around and talked about from very early on in this term, um, seeing that we invest in um, the diversity and equity. And so I just want to know if, how much of the 278 are we looking for? Um, is, is that all for salary? And actually much of these position, these budgets, um, what is the, the, you know, breakdown of salary and expenditures for communications or whatever may have you. Well, thanks for that. As you can see on the list, uh, they're predominantly uh, FTEs full-time. In this case, equity office, we're, we're suggesting two uh, full-time employees. Um, and you'll see beside each uh, other item, we'll, we'll indicate uh, which ones and how many staff associated. So every, every staff person that we're, we're, we're suggesting that would be the total compensation uh, as well as there's any ancillary, uh, like you said, cell phone mileage, uh, et cetera. The communication side, that, that resides in the corporate communications or strategic communications. So we would not have um, separate communications budget for every area, but, but rather bundled in that one, one space. Okay, great. And so, you know, I think uh, all of us would agree that it's important to make sure that, you know, we really do look at what type are, are the look at the talent and diversity equity and inclusion here in the city of Brampton I think Brampton is a unique city it's a mosaic so making sure we have people there in this equity office that is reflective of the city of Brampton but also can help uh, you know address the needs and the issues that our city is being faced with with regards to DV, diversity equity and inclusion um, so I, I really have no further questions actually sorry one more the increased public communication that is to have two more additional cycles and one fte person could you just explain that that piece there well thank you councillor through through the mayor that's correct so there's a cost uh, for the actual uh hard copy newsletters as well as the mailing um the so it, it, as many of you can appreciate, there's there's a tremendous amount of work uh, to do um, in terms of facilitation with every with every counselor leading into that process, and uh, so um, we're being advised that in terms of capacity, one additional FT would be a ju uh, certainly a junior role to assist with the you know two additional uh, citywide newsletters, both at the council ward level as well as citywide. So how is that different from Council Community Outreach, the 150? So um, if I may, through the Mayor, the increased communication uh, newsletter, that is a corporate administration expense. Um, the, the Council Community Outreach would be specifically housed in the Councillor's respective budgets. So that, 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 that would be the Councillor's to determine best use of that, uh, where on the Newsletter side, it's in the STRATCOM administrator budget. I see. Okay. Um, more resources to help us connect with the community is extremely important, um, but we just want to make sure that it's we're able to um, have the reach that we're intending to have with the, this um, budget um, addition. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to, I have no further questions. I'll just listen to hear what other counselors have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Williams. The next question is Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Thank you, uh, David, for the presentation. Um, I'm almost having, again, I, I don't know if I'm challenged, but it almost seems like I'm trying to play the game, connect the dots here. Um, so on one end, uh, so from the equity office, you've added two positions. So, and I know HR was the lead on a lot of this equity work, uh, but specifically, uh, when you talk about a one stop, would they be taking over some of the work from HR, which leads me to the second question, why then we would just wouldn't fall within, find within and have uh, positions transferred from there into this type. Uh, so that's that's my first one. Uh, second one, PMO office. So for example, I don't know your org chart, and, uh, if you can sort of send us maybe an understanding, because I see a position of policy and projects and so on, 
which you have uh, Gurdip as your uh, director there. And I don't know what falls under her, but then after we want to go out and create a PMO office outside of those responsibilities. So again, I'm trying to connect the dots. Community safety office, my understanding there is someone who, and correct me if I'm wrong in the BMO, who is sort of the lead on that, but we want to create a new FTE. So why wouldn't we just, you know, move that? And then after increased public communication, Mayor, um, in terms of, I, you know, I'll, I'll wait for my colleagues to, to speak about that. But I just find that, so what I'm, what I'm just ensuring that what's not happening is that there, you know, if anyone wants to take a shot, there isn't mandate creep or scope creep because a lot of this activity, you talked about, for example, right at the beginning, uh, the university, Riverwalk. Uh, well, for example, you have different departments working on that. So there seems to be sort of a, a duplication if the, if, if sort of the, the, the advocacy piece seems to be running through your office uh, and the work that from one department is actually doing the work, it just seems that there's a, a mixed match of corporate responsibilities uh, on who's doing what and um, simply, you know, adding FTEs for areas in which other areas may not be doing all of it, but are touching on it. And again, going back to sort of my, my uh, uh, right at the beginning where I said, you know, some of these positions when, we, you know, I, I need more information on, uh, you know, KPMG talks about, you know, center of excellence and capital compliance uh, and really focusing on that area. But we have other people doing that activity in other departments. Uh, we have our, uh, so when you look at the asset management that's being worked, you have, uh, you know, corporate policy or, or whatever project uh, coordination. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't understand sort of, I find some of this is rep repetition. Thank you, May uh, Mayor, uh, to the councillor. So there's a lot there, I'm gonna try to unpack it, uh, if I may. So the equity office, first and foremost uh, concept. So um, the, the diversity, equity, inclusion uh, component uh, always resided in the office of the CEO, not, not in HR. And so no doubt uh, HR certainly has a role to play. Um, it has resided, uh, you know, that's where it resided when I came on board and, and it still resides there. Um, we're suggesting the equity office piece because since, um, you know, uh, about in the spring or summer, there was the resolution by council to set up the anti-black racism and economic empowerment unit, w which is one person. Um, we're seeing increasingly uh, support and demand for uh, a variety of other, um, I would say, equity um, similar roles uh, and supports. Um, and so we, right now, there's not the resources to, to, to you know, to, uh, to support um, uh, all those areas and all those requests. We, we're identifying that certainly there's a, a pathway to, to be more equitable, inclusive across the board. Um, we're, we're suggesting the best way to do it administratively is in one area and it provides the clarity um, as, I, as I said, a one-stop shop. This is not unique. Uh, I believe Peel Region may have an equity office as well. Uh, so and then, so, but that leads to my question, why there seems to be repetition in, in a lot of this stuff here and a lot of the work. It sounds good when you say equity and inclusion and well, when you talk about equity internally, that's the only thing we can control because we're not a legislative, we can't go create legislation and create equity across uh, the city of Brampton or equity. Uh, that's why you have the Ontario Human Rights Commission. That's why you have uh, uh, ministries that are dedicated to that. The region does that. So again, it sounds nice, all this stuff, but these positions really don't have any teeth to them. So for someone, and, and going back to maybe he has been resigned the CEO's office, but HR are a lot of these issues where we talked about in the focus, a lot of it was internal on how our organization runs um, and how we sort of, uh, when you look at opportunity, you look at sort of uh, uh, what our staff people reflect. So that's fine. I, I don't need you to justify some of this. It's just, I, I don't understand, you know, for example, so when you talk about the PMO office, so distinguish, for example, what a PMO office would do and what, for example, uh, that office that you have. So even understanding your org chart, we have before in HR, uh, I mean, intergovernmental affairs, usually it was one uh, person, a staff person, which reported to the CAO. Uh, now this person reports to, if I'm not mistaken, to a director, a director who oversees it, or is it a different department directs, leads to you, uh, reports to you? Well, thank you. So through, through the mayor, once again, to the councillor, um, I, I do want to 
close the loop on the equity office piece because I, I know there's the references to HR and that, and once again that's true. But uh, look again, there's over 500 hiring managers in the city. Those hiring managers make the decisions. The HR does not make the decision. So it's an important context in the development, implementation, execution of the diversity, equity, inclusion strategy adopted by council that the resources be there to, to actually implement your priority um, rather than a plan that's approved and, and, and sitting on the shelf and, 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 and not being implemented is the last thing that I would recommend, uh, nor, nor I'm sure that council would, would like. Um, and so there's uh, a couple aspects and one is internal focus and one is uh, external focus. You know, we talk about changes in procurement so that uh, uh, various uh, other elements within our community can see themselves reflected in our procurement documents and have opportunities. So there's, a, there's, a, there's no shortage of work to do on that front and, and the scope is broad, but by design. And again, in consultation with our union partners uh, to help gain support for, for your policies and plans. The corporate projects versus the capital compliance. So in the organizational um, performance is where we're suggesting the capital compliance piece, the PMO office reside versus corporate, uh, corporate projects, which would be under the director of corporate projects, policy and liaise. The corporate projects are projects important to you. So Riverwalk, Riverstone, the LRT, BRT items, CFI, so those big interdepartmental projects that really haven't historically been coordinated appropriately. When you talk about duplication, I'd say uh, not necessarily duplication, but across such a variety of departments and there wasn't the proper linkage or coordination. So that linkage or coordination on those corporate projects that I've highlighted and others uh, would be housed under corporate products policy and liaise. The capital project, which is very different as you are aware, is, is how we're actually you know, completing projects on time, on budget. Yes, there's project managers across the corporation, but they do things differently. There's nothing consistent. And so um, there's, a, there's a variety of projects across the corporation that are still wide open, they're not closed. And so part of this is to give those people the resources, make it consistent across the corporation. And when a counselor or other staff have a question about what's the status of this, um, you have now one point of contact instead of, you know, trying to figure it out between three different people, right? Is it with procurement or is it with public works or is it with parks or so it's, it's to have that clarity and consistency mm -hmm. across the corporation. So again, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you through you, Mayor. So what you've identified exactly what you talked about, there's activity in different departments. So I guess going back to the base of my question, why wouldn't you repurpose some of the positions in other departments and then bring them in and add these to these? Like, why do we need to, you know, for the equity office, I still don't understand what that would mean in terms of equity and inclusion. You know, we do flag raisings. Uh, uh, you're talking about looking at a procurement process. You would assume that a lot of the work that we do already that, you know, our procurement folks would already be looking at from that uh, angle. Um, and I'm not sure what we would have two equity officers do. We added, I think, someone for uh, black empowerment and economic activity. And then on top of that, we want to add uh, two other people who then not only have to be experts in diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, which leads to another sort of question uh, uh, that we're not just throwing bodies, that these are people who are actually qualified and skilled in these areas. But then after the second is what, what would they really do in terms of, you know, over the next two years, uh, in terms of promoting equity and diversity and, and all this other stuff, which are excellent things, but that's sort of underlined across the corporation. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced on that, you know, no more, uh, uh, you know, it's one thing I can tell you when I was at the province, uh, when we looked at the policy process, I, I developed and I was on a, a project team which developed what we called a diversity lens that every single time you would have to go through a cabinet submission or get a policy passed, you would have to sort of uh, uh, make a sort of rationale uh, uh, to ensure that you've looked at equity and in, in inclusion. So that itself is a sort of a, a policy piece which can be sort of implemented across. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly I'm not sure two FTEs, uh, especially with the money we spend on consultants, that uh, you couldn't get a, a consultant report which would be sort of uh, uh, worked across and SMT would be sort of your accountable uh, towards that. So that aside, uh, the Community Safety Office, again, 
Um, I, I won't go in these, you know, I'll let other uh, councillors ask. So that that's one part. But for example, then getting to what you talked about the the projects, uh, you're saying that the the there's a lot of uh, projects, and rightfully so, that you know we're pushing Riverwalk and so on and so on. So who is assigned to that? How many staff do you have? Like, uh, let me understand your sort of uh, your org chart. So we have a director for policy coordination or project coordination and so on. So based on those things, what exactly in terms of her deliverables or, or what are they exactly doing the director? Well, thank you, uh, Councillor, through, through the mayor. So uh, I can certainly circulate the, uh, the org chart as it is and then, and then, you know, with these possible other elements. And I would reiterate that again, the items on this slide, uh, Councillor, we got from council and um, the PMO piece we got from KPMG. And so the logic and rationale you'll hear directly from KPMG on that aspect of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, this is here exactly for, you know, your consideration. Um, I, I'm not defending anything. I'm presenting it for uh, your consideration. And so um, with that, uh, as you noted, um, Riverwalk, as an example, you'll see there is a separate report coming forward to give greater detail on that aspect of it. And, and again, the, the, the success that the public affairs team, which resides within corporate projects policy and liaise, uh, is undeniable, over $100 million uh, that's been received from other levels of government and, con and the continuation of additional work on that front. So, oh, I, yeah, I, and, and respectfully, I would I would challenge that in terms of uh, how you sort of uh, paint success. But again, in terms of their level of influence and the work that they're doing, I'll leave it with you. But again, we had one person assigned or we had two people, uh, but now sort of you have a director level. And yeah, so I, I'd appreciate if you give us sort of just an understand because I don't know what's in your office, what's out of your office, what's in scope, what's out of scope. Uh, so that that would be one. So I'd appreciate that. And second, in terms of, I guess, these uh, investment and priorities, uh, understanding that it was council identified priorities, but I would sort of appeal to my colleagues to maybe repurpose current positions we have within the organization and have them sort of take this lead and responsibility. I'm not sure if we want to add more salary and more people uh, to a lot of this activity. I'm not sure how critical, especially when we're in the backdrop of COVID, but I appreciate uh, you presenting it. I guess my last question, would be around and i know we're going to get that sort of i made that request regarding consulting services because one of the major components of uh things which you talked about which are some intergovernmental file that uh we would have used consulting services uh to do some of this advocacy uh and we would have gone external is that correct uh yes that's correct and in fact uh, in, in many instances directly uh, sorry directed by council to do so uh, directed by council to use consulting services or approved by council. So uh, I guess, again, then I guess we'll have to see near the end, all the consulting services that we're sort of uh, contracting to the level of, I guess, staff that we have and to really, you know, what I want to ensure that we're getting value for money and that we're just not having bodies for bodies uh, to be there and we just don't have positions. So I am concerned with solving this activity here, which I think is, uh, 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 could be repurposed. And, and that's kind of the conversation I would like to see. Uh, uh, also regarding, I guess, uh, when I see the itemized list of our consulting services, but when you have a department, I guess, uh, uh, you have a director level uh, and you have a whole staff dedicated to intergovernmental affairs where, um, you know, besides uh, we had one person attributed before and a lot of departments do that activity. So there just seems to be a lot of repetition. So before I can sort of confidently support a lot of these sort of uh, these asks, um, I want to ensure that there is no duplication. And I, I, I'm not convinced that there isn't. Uh, and, you know, certainly uh, the mayor has more clout in a conversation with the minister to get these announceables than, you know, respectfully that staff are calling ministry uh, and getting a $100 million investment. I, I would uh, probably uh, say that, uh, uh, you know, the mayor in itself is, uh, is our, our greatest champion for intergovernmental affairs, but I appreciate that there has to be a, a full support. I just don't understand then what other departments are doing when it gets intergovernmental files, because then applications and everything is done through the departments. Uh, and I'm not sure in terms of the roles that some of these functions have. Uh, I'll pass this on. I'm sorry to my colleagues. I know that they are uh, uh, chomping at the bit. So I thank you very much. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, I guess I'll uh, look at the, the final results, but I would appreciate the org chart just to understand uh, who's in what and what are we exactly doing. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Councillor um, Medeiros, for um, those questions. And don't apologize at all. I, I think we do need to look at justifying every taxpayer dollar um, spent. So those are very instructive questions. And one thing that may be helpful um, from your line of questioning, um, and maybe David, you could provide this to council before we vote on the budget, is I think a number of these positions are related to motions um, uh, that were passed by council. I believe when we did the diversity, equity and inclusion uh, um, audit um, that we had that group um, I think CCDI out of Ottawa um, performed that audit. One of the recommendations that we we ratified, I believe, was to have a person assigned um, that works um, on on that. And I think that's one of the positions that would be in the equity office. But and then of course we had the anti-black racism position that was passed in that motion. So maybe if you could just explain where the linkage is for 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 these, and so there's a broader understanding. It, you're taking three or four positions that were already voted on by council together into one um, and that way we can understand what is mandate creep and what is council ratified um, uh, uh, positions um, because I, I, I do think council Medeiros makes um, a good point of always looking to make sure we don't have mandate creep, creep especially during um, a backdrop of COVID where it is financially challenging for, for everyone so thank you Medeiros for yeah, Martin for those um, those questions next on our list um is just looking on my list councillor santos councillor santos and if i'm looking up and down councillors apologies i'm on the gta mayor's call at the same time and so i'm speaking to mayor Tory's group and participating in this one at the same time so i'm trying my best to multitask unfortunately the gta mayor's call will be over shortly so i won't have to look at two screens for much longer uh, thank, you you, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, appreciate the multitasking. Um, just a few questions uh, up for the CAO. Um, the Community Safety Office, um, it was unclear to me in the beginning as to where that was particularly coming from, um, but community safety obviously is a priority for our city. Um, if there's any way that you can just elaborate a bit more in terms of what the mandate would be for the community safety office and, and how we would deal with the overlap um, of jurisdiction issues related to the region and the police. So that's the first question. Um, my next thing is uh, yes, in regards to the equity office, um, Mayor Brown is correct. In December of last year, uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion audit, as well as plan and recommendations were brought forward. And in addition to a suggestion to have a separate equity office, Councillor Harkirat Singh and I passed a motion unanimously supported by Council to seek uh, an amendment to seek the endorsement from our labor partners. And over the past year, uh, we have been working very hard to get that endorsement of the recommendations in that diversity, equity, inclusion plan and uh, received confirmation that our labor partners will all be supporting it and its implementation. And every single one of them had suggested that they want to see the resources allocated in order to implement that plan. And every single one had wanted us to implement also a, ne a separate equity office. And so that's direction directly from our labor partners from the ground. Um, and also from last year when we unanimously supported um, the recommendations and the plan. My final question will be more about the operating budget and how long we can keep going with respect to decreasing the amount and contribution we make to reserves every single year before uh, we start to have challenges with our operating budget and uh, have to look at service cuts. So those are my three questions and I'm hoping that the CAO, while writing them down, has had some time to, to think about it and respond. Well, that's great. Thank you, Councillor, through, through the Mayor. So the community safety um, role, as noted, so right now there's a single FTE and um, there's no doubt that you know community safety is is extremely important uh, to everyone in all parties and you heard earlier in one of the presentations the discussion about community safety uh, and additional resources um, and so where 
very cautious about you know the perception that if we if we have if we're calling community safety office or enhanced community safety portfolio what we're talking about here is one additional FTE that's no no impact to the levy is that we're not seen to be solely responsible because we're not however and council knows this you never want to tell a resident or constituent or a counselor not our responsibility not our job and point the other way and so that's why uh, you know we we believe that's why there is uh, one person right now but i'd say that one uh, ft is uh, is extremely uh, i guess has a lot of work uh, on 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 their plate and so i i think this is important context to finally get some direction from council on council what what role do you see the city having right and so our suggestion is uh, there is one in terms of facilitation um, and putting some pieces together, but not to take the lead. So, you know, we have the Community Safety Advisory Committee. Um, certainly the, the uh, regional police have an incredible role to play. Peel Region has an incredible role to play, but also our community partners and nonprofits, et cetera. So this will just help um, the facilitation and coordination. Um, you know, uh, often, you know, people are asking, what is the city doing for community safety? But when you bundle everything that's happening in the community, everything that's happening in Brampton on community safety, conducted by all parties, the list is substantial. But no one's, you know, what we're suggesting is helping to piece that all together and, and package it to, to best fit uh, the city of Brampton. So, uh, but again, that's here for, for council um, as consideration to clearly define for staff, what role do you want the city to have in community safety? Um, and so I hope that answers that that part. It does. Think, it, it does a bit, um, CEO Beric. I just have one follow-up just to highlight all the various things that are being juggled on the community safety portfolio. We have currently one person, I believe, who was assigned to community safety, um, who is responsible for attending and creating reports and follow-up items for the Community Safety Advisory Committee as well as all the various other community safety initiatives and motions we throw their way, um, as well as things like the Nurturing Neighborhood Enhanced Program, and last year also working and in, in, uh, dealing with the Neighborhood Watch Program. So like I could see why we would want to have one extra person assigned to community safety. Uh, oh, on top of that, liaising with the region and with the police on uh, downtown Brampton issues, as well as the community safety well-being plan. Like there is currently only one person right now assigned to do all of that work. So I certainly support uh, want that one extra person, as long as we're clear to the public what our mandate is on the community safety portfolio. And then I guess my only other questions were if you have any further comments about the equity office piece and, and the union endorsements that we have received to support the equity office, um, as well as the, the final questions was on the um, how long can we go um, to, to continue decreasing our contributions to reserves in order to compensate for tax a uh, zero percent tax increase without impacting operating budgets and service cuts. Well, that's great. Thank you, um, Councillor, through, through the mayor. So the equity office component, as discussed, um, uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, work to be to be conducted there. And, and again, it's a matter of degrees uh, and it's a matter of how much can we get done with the resources that we have. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of excitement and momentum and inertia uh, to your point, Councillor, with respect to the the possibility of the uh, uh, all of our collective agreements and unions um, supporting uh, the concept of an equity office and the good work that that office would do in terms of the clarity around you know the anti-black racism uh, unit, uh, the the diversity strategy. Um, we talk about accessibility, seniors and youth, uh, rather than various functions across the corporation. It's in one place. And it has the resources uh, to be able to support all the various groups within the municipality, uh, the corporate wide and, and, and externally. So for those who are, who are looking to uh, get hired by the city, for those who are looking to be a vendor for the city. Um, so it's not only a, 
uh, internal, but but also that that liaise aspect with the community as well. And we'll have a report coming from the anti-black and economic uh, anti-black racism economics empowerment unit uh, to to show you some of the work that that is being conducted there right now. Hope, hopefully, we'll give it an indicator in terms of the the width and breadth of the uh, scope of work being conducted. Um, on the sustainability uh, question, and, and look, I would I would go back to some questions about duplication. Um, I would say, you know, this year, possibly the third year, uh, zero straight, uh, has put downward pressure on the organization, and, and that's okay. I mean, it just, it squeezes out the duplication. Uh, but I think we're getting to a point now, uh, certainly next year, in terms of managing expectations for another zero without impacting service levels uh, is questionable today. Um, and so I, I think it's important that council has that line of sight. Um, the added challenge and no other municipality has is uh, the 3% special levies um, on top of, you know, 2% 2, 2 from, from a collective agreement aspect. Um, a zero is not, not a zero, it's actually ne a negative. And, and, and that's okay because as I stated, it, it puts the downward pressure on the organization to weed out those inefficiencies and weed out the duplication. But I think we're, we're, we're getting pretty close, uh, but I understand uh, certainly the context of the emergency and, and the need in the community. Um, but to your point, I think the question is more the sustainability aspect. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's a question for all of us. Um, and ultimately, council will be the decision maker in terms of continuation of zeros on top of additional uh, capital infrastructure um, or and or considering the service level impacts. Um, and so that may not be this year, but it certainly will be next year's uh, budget cycle. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Santos. I believe the next question is Councillor Singh. Uh, David, uh, thanks. For, well, thank you very much. And I want to pick up uh, where you left off with the concern for next year. Uh, because um, I feel that maybe all these initiatives, though they're um, well-intentioned, um, perhaps instead of trying to do all of them at once, if you were to pick sort of the two or three you think are critical to start this year, um, would you, just from your side, which ones would you uh, sort of lean towards? Well, th thank you, Councillor. I mean, really, it's a question for Council. Uh, these have been selected from feedback from you as well as uh, KPMG. So that's why they're all here. Uh, once again, I would suggest, uh, look, 1% is $5 million. Yeah. Uh, this 1.5 million that is here um, is not an ask. Um, th this would be uh, absorbed and, and still achieve possibly zero. So it's not an ask for, for new money. And if it, the intent is to pile this towards uh, lowering the t overall 2%, there's still uh, there's still a long way to go. In other words, in terms of value for money, um, I think these items that are selected here all provide an incredible amount of value for money and meet some of the gaps that currently exist in the corporation. Mm. But do you think um, they need to be, like, for example, I'm looking at uh, Center of Excellence. Do you need to start with three full-time people right away? Or would you like to build up to three? You know, that, what I'm thinking is, do we need to start with that sort of intensity across uh, all six, well, one, two, three, four. Yeah, the six of the main uh, initiative. They see library, but it will keep that separate. Yeah, and, and I think that that question you probably can ask the KPMG when they when they present um, okay. and see what they tell you. But but certainly it would require uh, you know some resource, some coordinated yeah. uh, effort. Yeah. Um, to your point, maybe start with two and then build, build towards three. Um, yeah, I'll let my colleagues also uh, talk. I, I think some of the initiatives also maybe we can move uh, down, uh, you know, um, don't have to start ne uh, necessarily this year. Um, you know, I'm not fully convinced on the community safety office, increased public communication, community outreach, um, you know, especially given the, you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic. So, you know, they're good ideas and maybe next year would be better to start them. Um, and in the meantime, we can begin the equity office and center of excellence and, and sort of get the learnings from that by next year as well. See what we did well and, uh, 
Yeah, but I'll let my colleague speak, see where everybody stands. Uh, you know, if we want to start all these priorities this year, that's okay. But uh, I'm leaning more towards um, starting some this year and, and possibly moving some down to uh, a year or two down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Councillor Dillon. Councillor Dillon? Councillor Dillon, your microphone is muted if you wish to unmute your mic. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can. Sorry about that. Um, the question I have, uh, uh, David, is uh, in terms of the, the diversity office. Um, it's, the, uh, it's something that we've been, I've been pushing since the last term. Uh, and so I'm really uh, glad to see it. Um, and, uh, you know, we asked for the diversity uh, audit to be uh, done as well. I I've asked for a few updates over the past year. Um, I, I wasn't able to get, I was able to have a meeting uh, with your staff uh, pre-COVID um, and uh, I wasn't really able to get much after that uh, due to COVID. So I'm just wondering, um, have you worked with uh, some of the councillors? I know particularly probably uh, Councillor Santos, Singh and I uh, in Williams uh, in regards to this. Uh, I, I haven't been uh, briefed uh, I don't even know what the framework is. Is that something we're still deciding? Like we're getting the budget now and we're going through the framework or is it something that we can see? Because I, I really don't, uh, uh, I really didn't uh, have an idea of what, so what to expect. So there's two um, staff members um, and what specifically are their roles going to be or is that something we're going to be deciding? Well, thank you, Councillor, for the question through through the mayor. Um, so there, there's a couple of uh, things there. One is, yes, Council uh, approved and endorsed the DE&I uh, policy framework. And so now it's the implementation aspect of it. Uh, to your point, uh, you know, we, we were on track and, and uh, you know, the emergency hit, hit in March and that meant, uh, you know, we, we froze uh, vacancies and a lot of staff were repurposed uh, to support task forces in other areas. So uh, we're, we're, you know, navigating this process, um, getting things back on track. Uh, and again, in that duration, there was also the addition of the anti-black and economic empowerment, uh, anti-black racism, economic empowerment unit. Um, and so uh, we're looking at the implementation side in terms of the demand that's out there from both council, councillors and the community and our ability to, to, to actually implement and ramp up. There's a gap in our conversations with uh, our union partners as well. Um, so the concept of the equity office, the two additional FTEs uh, is really to ramp up the implementation side in terms of uh, once again, uh, communication, education, uh, engagement, policy uh, adjustments. Um, and so I, I think that the details with which, uh, I think the intent would be to hire an equity office manager and let that person um, you know, the subject matter expert really figure out the best way to utilize the, uh, the resource while considering the whole picture, as I stated, uh, you know, whether it's accessibility or youth and seniors and the anti-black racism unit and, and the overall strategy for implementation. Um, have, have counselors been contacted? Has, is your staff work with counselors on this up to what we have so far? Uh, so I know there's been uh, a level of uh, communication in terms of uh, just a checkpoint uh, wh where things are at, but uh, I don't believe beyond that, certainly it's something I can follow up on. Right. Uh, it has, uh, and I'll ask uh, counselors after if they've, been, if they've had any engagement, but because uh, I, I, I've had none, and obviously this is something I was, I've been pushing uh, for pretty hard. Uh, and so I understand you're saying we could ha hire a manager um, and you know, we spoke about implementation. Is there a basic framework that we have in mind? And can you, is there anything that you can send us or have we just simply been frozen up to this point since COVID hit uh, and we're just getting the budget, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the budgetary uh, requirements passed now? 
And are we going to start now, or what, like what work has been done? Thank you, Councillor, through the mayor. So, yes, there's been some work that's been done, and as I noted, it's um, I think it's managing the expectation of where people would like to see us, and our ability to actually get there is a gap. So, yes, there's been right. some some pieces on on education outreach. There's been some policy. Um, there's been some slow implementation, but as I stated, you know, even from hearing from you now and, and others and our union partners, people want to see more quick movement on this file. And uh, so that's why it's here. No, I understand it, but I'm just, we're, we're talking about movement on the file and work's been done, but like, what, what, I, I'm, I've been asking, I've been emailing for, for months, I haven't got an update, but what work has been done? Uh, thank you through the mayor. I, sorry, Councillor, I thought that you did get a response. If you haven't, I'll make sure that uh, that you do get one. But can you state here what work has been done, though? I don't have the details in front of me, Councillor, um, in terms of specifics, but I, I do recall seeing some emails that I, that I can circle back and make sure it's given to everybody. But that, that, that's fine, there, uh, David. We can you can send me the emails, but I'm, sh I'm sure there's like some very high level description though that you can provide. Thank you uh, through the mayor. So the the high level description I thought I had provided in in terms of the DEI strategy that's already been approved by council, which which you've seen, um, it has a timeline and table in terms of what's to be achieved in 2020. Um, and most of those are policy pieces, um, and uh, a lot of that work has been done. Right, and so I'm I'm just more looking towards the structure of the office. Is and so if that's something that you're unable to answer now and can provide me uh, in an email, would you be able to provide me that like as soon as possible? Though. Yeah. So the structure. Um, uh, certainly, we can provide that. I think it, it at this point it would be malleable depending on whether council supports the additional two FTEs or not. That, that would make an adjustment, but certainly can show you kind of what it looks like today versus how this one-stop shop could uh, could assist. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know. I think it's uh, extremely important. And uh, I guess uh, if, if anybody's not aware of what uh, uh, an equity office does, I think it's, uh, it plays a critical role. Uh, and it's, a, uh, it's an independent, uh, uh, office usually uh, from from the council and the administration, and it's uh, and they make the recommendations. They give their comments on uh, significant uh, city initiatives that we have. I'll give you an example. We, you know, I I don't think we've uh, done as good a job as we could have on, uh, for example, fireworks. I've had complaints from residents on why particularly we have um, fireworks education week right before um, Diwali, where, um, you know, having these campaigns to go against people who are celebrating fireworks on Diwali. But uh, we don't have these ones uh, on any of the other days we celebrate. So it kind of lets other residents know who might not be uh, familiar with Diwali or the South Asian community that, okay, this is a problem. You know, fireworks safety equals uh, Diwali and South Asian people. So it, it gives the wrong impression for people. And so having this independent voice this other perspective this diverse uh, perspective is extremely important uh, for how we shape policy how we deal how we engage with our residents and so uh, i'm really looking forward to, to working with uh, you david uh, and staff on how we really shape and mold this uh, in the best way possible so uh, i look forward to it uh, i'm supportive of the 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 di uh, uh, sorry the the diversity and equity uh, office um, but I just have one question for you. Um, what was the, um, and this is what I'm like, like, uh, unaware of. I don't know. Do we need one, uh, officer, uh, sorry, uh, uh, staff person there? Do we need two? Um, how did we come up with, what was the rationale for two as opposed to one? Well, thank you, uh, Councillor, through, through the mayor. So, the rationale is just based on current current work, um, and uh, I know Gwen from from the uh, anti-black racism and economic empowerment unit. It's it's called a unit, but it's one person. And uh, uh, as I stated, there will be a report forthcoming, I believe, maybe next week that um, will demonstrate some of that. Um, so, 
So there's, um, there's a lot of work on that particular front alone. And when we see the additional, in other words, I'm suggesting, um, you know, that role requires an additional support alone, right? So it would be, would be one possibly. And so the other aspect is uh, all those other things that I talked about in terms of uh, accessibility, youth, seniors, the implementation of the strategy, uh, as well as other demographics in the community. Um, so when we look at the whole picture, um, you know, two, two is, uh, uh, we felt was responsible in terms of work uh, versus, uh, um, you know, fiscal realities. So you'll be working with the uh, council uh, going forward on this. Is that correct? Just want to make sure. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, the the uh, we're here to support council. So, so absolutely. Yeah, just and the reason I say it because I've asked for updates, didn't get any updates, and uh, uh, you know we're at this point now, which is a good point. But uh, I want to make sure that uh, some of the councillors are really uh, involved and who who uh, have really worked on this. That you know we're all working together on this and making sure that uh, uh, we get this done right, uh, and then. Uh, uh, obviously, after uh, a year or whatever, that uh, there'll be some type of review uh, and that we move forward from that point. But uh, uh, I don't have any further questions. If anybody else, uh, you know, has any comments in regards to, to this, uh, we're open to listening to it. But uh, uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dillon, for those questions. Next up, we have Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple of questions. The um, newsletters and increasing the number of newsletters um, for next year. Uh, Peter, is, is it the election year that we cannot produce newsletters or is there, there is some rule and regulation about what we can and can't do the year of the election, correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there is a, a self-imposed restriction um, for the election year, which is 2022. It would not impact any newsletters for 2021. Thank you. And that's that's my whole point. Like, we would be doing this for one year, and then we would be coming into a year where we do not do any of it at all. So um, that's my worry, that we're going to be adding staff to do two additional newsletters, and then they won't exist in the following year uh, during the election and during the election campaign. So I do have um, I do have an issue with creating the additional um, newsletter pieces. Um, perhaps that money can be, you know, if, if the choice is made, that could be divvied up to um, a community safety office or, or whatever um, library, wherever, wherever we need that money. Um, what are we doing in terms of looking forward to future levies like putting together our part of the Riverwalk project or our part of the new hospital, um, which we're going to be fully expected to put probably 30% or more into. What are we doing now to start putting money away for those projects? Well, thank you, Councillor, through the mayor. Um, on Riverwalk, now, there is a separate report coming forward, um, and I know Jane's online and can possibly speak to that aspect of it. Um, and sorry, you mentioned uh, Riverwalk and one other one, oh, the hospital. So yep. the, ho the hospital piece, um, currently we have, uh, this. the city has $20 million uh, set aside for phase two. So that's today. Um, so, you know, when the province gets rolling and makes the announcement on phase two, um, we already have $20 million ready to go. At that point, would be a consideration brought to council in terms of any additional hospital levy or not. Um, but we're, you know, we're we're ready to a degree on that front. And uh, once again, on Riverwalk, perhaps Jane uh, can add some more. Uh, through the mayor, thanks, David. Um, yeah, we do have a report, um, Councillor Bowman, that we are we're going to be bringing forward uh, shortly. It will discuss, you know, our next steps in terms of detailed design and um, some possible paths forward in terms of, um, you know, how we might get uh, some additional funding from uh, the, our provincial um, counterparts and, um, you know, how we might also uh, fund it uh, for whatever the city's portion is as well. So we, we do have a more detailed report coming, 
coming shortly on that. Okay, so in I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, Jane, but in that report, there would be suggestions about how we're going to pay for this. Um, you, we can we can look at some paths forward. I mean, we'd have to have some discussions with uh, other folks in the in our um, organization um, and do some outreach with our um, our provincial contacts. But sure, um, to the best of our ability, Councillor, we're going to try and lay out a path forward of what some suggestions might be going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, final question, and um, I, I, this the the equity office. I understand we had the equity audit. I understand we voted to um, uh, do do something about it, put something in place. Um, we've got the anti-black racism position in place. We've got a seniors council. Um, we've got youth hubs coming, and we've got youth councils. What what sort of things are going to drive the activities of the Equity Inclusion Office? Sorry, Councillor, through the mayor, uh, the question was what uh, which activities drive that office? Uh, yeah, I mean, David, I'm to be quite honest, I'm I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, okay, so what's going to be the next group to come forward we we, we recognize inclusion um so you know is there is there going to be a group of of um other individuals that that are not so um visible or vocal or maybe have disabilities uh, what is going to drive the activity of this office so thanks for that. I think, uh, you know, in line with Councillor Dillon's questions, the, the best way to further the discussion may be uh, with, with me uh, providing some additional information to you uh, in advance of the, the, um, the finality of this budget process. So I, I've been messaging some staff while we're having the discussion to uh, get pulling this information together, which we'll provide to you. Um, and that may, that may assist uh, when, we, when we have our next budget meeting, if that's helpful for now. Yeah, it's helpful. I just, you know, the, the it's the whole term, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, that's pretty broad. And, and you know, I, I want to understand what activities are going to be driven through this office and who is going to be driving those activities that we're looking for, whether it's council or whether it's our committee structure or who it is. So if that's included in, in whatever information you can give us, David, I would appreciate that. Will thank do, you. thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Bowman. And I would just remind Council, you know, and I hopefully get this explanation from the CEO, but these come from things that Council has ratified. And so we, we ratified the recommendations of the diversity, inclusion, and equity report. And if we want to revisit that and not ratify, that's one thing. But I think what Councillor Medeiros was speaking to before was not really challenging um, the motions that we have passed on the recommendations, but just making sure that there isn't duplication, which is, um, I think, different than than revisiting decisions that council has made from uh, reports like the diversity, equity, and inclusion report. Um, looking down at the list right here, um, who is next? Is it Councillor William um, Williams? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, through you, Mayor. Um, so just listening to some of the comments and questions, uh, David, could you just clarify, I know before we, um, before this budget asked for the equity office, um, and after we did the diversity, equity, inclusion um, report and ratify, there were, there was a plan to have somebody um, in your office working on this, this file, is that correct? Thank you, Councillor, through the mayor. That is correct. So what and that but that position didn't actually get filled. And can you explain um, or speak to that? Well, well, thank you, Councillor. So, yes, it, it, it was filled um, and that person moved to another role within the organization. Uh, so there there was a uh, transition. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, that that is correct that um, uh, there there's that role that needs to be filled currently. But that's so, not this date work's not being done. 
Right. Um, I, because I do remember after George Floyd, there was conversations around what what is happening with that file. There was a gap there um, and it nothing had really been done on it since um, since I think the the new year, early in the new year. So I, I do remember having those conversations. But there hasn't been many conversations outside of the the unit, and so it's good to hear you say that a reporter is going to be coming forward um, from Gwen. I think there, um, a lot of us, you know, have ideas of what's happening, but there hasn't been that much, um, at least council wide, um, clarity on what what work has been done so far. So it's good to hear that coming forward. But in regards to those one to two positions, or that one position that was gap there is no one there this ask is for two more on top of that correct so in total there'll be three um on top of gwen so um four people or bodies working on diversity equity inclusion anti-black racism um you know everything that is um diversity and inclusion at the city of brampton uh, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I mean, subject to these conversations with Council, that's correct. Okay, that's correct. So this this is the good the starts of a good office. Professionals who understand the impacts of not having a diversity, equity, inclusion office that speaks to the gaps in support that is provided for the Indigenous, um, for the Black African um, Caribbean community, for the, the Sikh community, for every single person here in Brampton that needs to have um, advocacy and also to help us have those lens and, and to make sure even all of our communication strategies, everything, the hiring, that good scrutinization of our HR with regards to um, you know, who we're hiring and also, um, you know, with bias and all of those very impactful areas that have not been looked at in the city that have really impacted the way people in our corporation um, work and, and work in the spaces that we have. So it's good to see that this work will be done. And I'm assuming this is not just going to be for internal, it will be external as well. We're gonna have that um, intersection of both to make sure everybody is considered. Um, and because of that though, with the community safety office, um, working with Resmin quite closely on many of the community safety initiatives in the city, it, uh, as Councilor Santos mentioned, it there is a lot on her plate. And what, could you just clarify, is there another person that's on a maternity leave or that was on a maternity leave that has taken over some of support for, for our community safety officer here? Uh, thank you, Councillor. On the uh, equity piece, I would just add to your point in terms of internal, external, that, that's correct. Uh, it would suggest more expert FTEs would support reducing the number of consultants hired as well to support the various initiatives and concerns related to DE&I. Um, and I, and I apologize, on the maternity uh, coverage question, I, I don't have that answer. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. I just wanted to know if there was an extra person. So um, I know hearing what um, Peter Fay mentioned earlier about the the election cycle and so on. Um, I wonder if it, if another my my colleagues can can chime in. But I just wonder what about using some of that um, communication newsletter money to go into the community safety office, put the money in there. Then that way, like Councillor Bowman mentioned earlier, I actually think that's not a bad idea considering we might not be able to use all of the um, the, the we might not be able to use the resource for the extra newsletter. Seeing the, the year is almost over, and I mean it's, it's soon to start. But I'm just wondering if that is something to consider to um, make sure that our community safety office does have um, sufficient people there to actually do the work um, and to liaison and to um, support the many um, questions and concerns that c council has, but also the community has regarding community safety. So just throwing that out there, and I think it might be something for us to really consider and talk about and uh, see what what happens. Thank you. Okay, the next question is um, going down the list. Councilor Medeiros. Councilor Medeiros. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Just very quickly, and I, I appreciate everyone's comments, and I, I support them. Thank you, CEO. 
Uh, and I think the mayor was very accurate what I was trying to say. I identify a lot of this activity as good activity, but I think Council Bowman raises, you know, very important in terms of some of the stuff that we're doing. We're two years away from an election. Some of these are new business. Uh, uh, Councillor Singh also uh, talked about prudence. Um, and, and again, I, I just want to remind everyone in terms of expectations, you know, even from a diversity perspective, I, and I want people to really sort of chime in on it. No one, for example, represents more diversity than us ourselves as councillors when it comes to how we address with our residents, to ensuring that we have their support, understanding if there's issues that they have with one policy issue or not. That's a reflection of our job, and we bring that to council. The, the other comment I would say for what I've heard about these uh, sort of possible diversity officers, that they would be all-encompassing. They would have to be an expert in procurement. They would have to be an expert in communication. They would have to be an expert in every area. So I'm just concerned of having a couple of bodies kicking around who are not exactly, you know, they're doing sort of activity that are other people there that we pay to do. So if you're talking to me about how do we know that, uh, you know, it, it, uh, uh, that our HR policy is equitable and that we're getting the best, you know, bang for the buck and et cetera, et cetera, then there has to be that activity already being done in HR. And if it isn't, there's a gap there. But then after we have to see, is this the best way of identifying these two positions? Because what I'm hearing is this H, these, you know, diversity officers would come in and they would relate with each department and they would try to find, you know, they would say, well, how is this through a diversity lens is your office running this? Well, they would have to be an expert in all these different areas. So again, unless they have teeth, you know, regardless of be it diversity, regardless of be it community safety and all this other stuff, just to have bodies and positions just to say, look, we have a community officer and, you know, how are we going to measure how important that community safety officer is? How are you going to go to your residence and justify we added $100,000 because we hear already there's too much salaried staff already at the city. If you look at our percentage of what we're at, 57%, I think, is the average. And we're going to be adding bodies. And then after, what is the deliverable? So that's something that I think we just have to rethink. And especially when it comes to this budget, especially during this year, that ensuring that we're adding people, that there's teeth in what there's actual doing. What's the productivity and what's the return on the investment? And what exactly do we want to achieve? Do we want to say, oh, uh, there's problems in, you know, civil society, uh, but we have an equity office. So please, uh, you know, that shows that we're really uh, supporting uh, equity and diversity. Uh, it's not exactly that. And that's not what everyone means. So I I'm not sure you know, within the, the diversity communities that I know, unless we have, you know, some strong teeth behind that messaging, and that's just one area. So I, I, I just want to be cognizant and I'm not sure. Uh, and that's why when I talk about repurposing, is that I'm sure it's not simply dipping into our reserves to say, oh, look, it's not going to have a budget hit. I think we have to sort of really make that conscious effort. If we add, we have to take away. If we add, we find within. And it's not simply just going to our reserves. So that's the last comment. Thank you. And Councillor Pelosi. Councillor Pelosi. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. So I'm, I, Councillor Madero has asked for us to chime in, so I'm going to try and chime in here. I, I think I'm following along, um, Councillor Madero, and, and with the equity office, I'm trying to understand, um, you know, I'm trying to understand what the what what the actual deliverables are, and and and, and downstream what what ultimately um, we're we're trying to we're trying to achieve. And the way I see um, to to be bringing fairness in terms of uh, um, equality and inclusion is 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 cross city. It's not you, we we can't put it in one particular spot and have it managed out of that one spot. From you know from from myself, what I would like to see is more opportunity in going uh, as far as training across the corporation um, to ensure that we have the inclusion that we need in each department when dealing with um, matters that pertain to to the uh, to the city much like all of council at the regional level and both uh, uh, um, also at the city uh, level we did go through um, uh, some high level training I think that maybe that's something that should be incorporated maybe every every once a year as 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 we uh, as we continue the the conversations but maybe this is something that is um 
if we're if we're talking about cross corporation, the training going into into different um, different departments is where we need to see more of the equity within the uh, within the city. So, David, I guess my question then would be: Is currently um, what happens at at the department levels, and how do we see this these two FTEs? working with the, each department to ensure um, that the training and and the inclusion of everything is, is um, continues in the day-to-day -day operation of the business. Well, well thank you, Councillor. Um, through the Mayor, um, I'm getting a, a variety of uh, responses from staff as we're having this conversation. And my, my best suggestion is that we, um, if you can allow us a little bit of time to have one comprehensive coordinated coordinated response, uh, we can get to you um, either by end of day today or first thing tomorrow. That may help in answering all of these questions. Okay, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have we shouldn't have an expert in the field. We should always have an expert in the field when we're talking about something like this that is so important to to our uh, our community and the residents that we represent. So, so I'm not trying to get away from from um, the the experts. And I and I recall lots of conversations that Councillor Dillon had about about trying to get this up and running and rolling. And and you know I think we're closer because of him. And I think we're closer because of um, just the way the council uh, feels and talks and, and discusses matters today, but I think uh, I, I look forward to 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 that approach coming back. As for the um, newsletter, so um, currently, Peter, is it is it we cannot put out newsletters um, in in an election year? because of that January 1 and then recently and then changed in the last election to be, I think, uh, May. Um, did that follow along with that? So is there still an opportunity to put out a newsletter from January 1 until, until I guess, I don't know what you call it, the, they call it the writ drops at the province and the, and the federal level, but at the municipality, I'm not sure what you call it. Through you, the, Mr. The Mayor. The sign update. Yes, so through you, Mr. Mayor, it's, uh, the equivalent of the writ being dropped provincially and federally is nomination day for the municipal election. And nominations opened in 2018 in May and closed in July. And the council policy in place at the time was there could be no newsletters issued by members of council after nomination day, which was a July 2018 date. The province recently amended the Municipal Elections Act and nomination day has moved now to the third Friday in August of 2022. So consistent with the current policy that's in effect for use of corporate resources during an election, um, a newsletter could not be released after that third Friday in August in 2022, which is nomination day. There's nothing precluding newsletters being issued prior to that date in an election year. And so current currently, policy. thank you, Peter, and currently that because of that current policy, we still have the uh, ability to put out newsletters within our budget, not including this 303 um, currently within the budget. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, newsletters, whether they're issued corporately or from a councillor's budget, could be issued up until start of nomination, up until nomination day. After nomination day, um, it, there are restrictions in place in terms of no communications um, that are issued by uh, funds paid for by the municipality because the basis of the Municipal Elections Act is a municipality cannot make a contribution to a campaign. And um, some members of council may be candidates at that point in time. Right, but now that now that we're allowed to, so when this when I don't recall, I think this policy was in effect before I even uh, before any of us were even counselors. <clears throat> That's so correct. From, so okay, so from my understanding now is we can we can put out newsletters in an election year before nomination date, and does are are we asking for more money? to provide that because they, they changed the date from original, original January 1 to now in August is what you're saying. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll only speak to the dates. I won't speak to the, the oh. additional newsletters, um, but uh, the policy was in effect and you, you're a correct counselor. 
Um, under the current policy, if nothing else changes, members of council and or the corporation could issue newsletters on behalf of the elected officials up until nomination day, which right now is the third Friday in August of 2022. Okay, I understand that. Can somebody tell me if this, if the monies that are being um, suggested in this budget are because of the change in nomination date? Thank you, Councillor David here through the mayor. So um, the, the rationale for the increased uh, consideration here has really been uh, the demonstration through the emergency period of, of the increased need for that level of communication between council councillors and, and their constituents. Um, uh, with the uh, city hall uh, closure um, to the public, uh, the amount of questions certainly our, our, our 311 team and, com and communication staff are, are taking on. We're finding the best the best path and method of communicating is, is through our best ambassadors and that, and that is council. And, and um, so I, we anticipate that would only continue uh, leading into next year. Okay. For the council community outreach, the 150, is that, that 150 divided amongst 11 members of council, so essentially almost 14,000 per councillor added to their budget? Thank you, councillor. Through the mayor, so the anticipation there is approximately um, $7,500 per ward and then um, all wards for the mayor's office. I don't know how that would work. If it's 7,500 per ward, that's my, my math tells me that that takes up the 150. So it's about no, 75,000 and then, and then the, uh, the additional, the additional monies goes to the mayor for, uh, for all for across the city. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And that's an increase in our, in our budget. That aspect would be attributed to each respective councillor and the mayor. That's correct for, for use as you see fit. Okay, so can we get um, when you're reporting back later today? Can you can you give us um, an update on our our total budgets as well, or is that going to be included in the mayor member council budgets? I believe the uh, Q3 is actually that report is on deck for the budget process. I'm not sure if Mark Medeiros is on hand to be able to confirm that. We would have the Q3 numbers for you at least. Okay. Uh, through the chair to the council, yes, that's correct. We we have the Q3 report on hand that shows the total mayor and members of council. Uh, we also have the details online that show cost center by cost center, but if you wish, we could distribute what your 2021 budgets would be by cost center, and in addition, add this 150 to show you what the total would look like. I don't understand what cost center is. It, it's basically your your bucket of funding. So I, I believe you have about, um, I can't remember the specific amount per counselor, but each of you have a cost center where you can charge all your salaries and your expenses. So it can show you by counselor um, what, what your budget is in 2021. And then when we layer on this 150, what it would be. Right, okay, okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Okay, I don't see any other speakers. So to the city clerk, where does that take us now? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that is the end of the departmental presentations. Uh, next is the, there is a number of staff reports, uh, one that to the Q3 um, status report was just mentioned. And those are item 8.1 through to 8.5, I believe it is for committee's consideration. Okay, do you wanna have a motion for, to take accepting the staff reports now or is that done after? I mean, the, the, the departmental. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe we should probably do the, uh, I'll look for some guidance from finance in the CEO's office. We can receive the presentations, but uh, there are a number of um, budgets that have implications in terms of approving the budgets. And okay. there, there may be a few amendments that we'll have to work on the wording for those okay. motions. Okay. So on that note, um, we, um, oh, did Councillor Plush just ask to speak again? 
Um, yeah, I was going to wait until you, you kind of laid out what we're doing next, but I do have a motion that I, I've sent to members of council that I wanted to uh, to be able to put on for uh, for discussion. Yeah, and so what I was going to suggest, um, Councillor Pelleschi, um, just for, and, and you're, you can certainly do that today. I was thinking that today we get through all the staff reports, all the department reviews, and then tomorrow any councillors who have motions, we could deal with them um, then. But um, if we have time today, we could also deal with motions, um, some of the motions today. Okay, no, I'm good. I've sent it to all members to be to be ready for for that discussion. So I've sent it to all m members in separate emails. Thank you. Okay, so then um, what's the first staff report we have to go over, uh, Peter? The, um, Mr. Mayor, it is item 8.1, which is a staff report regarding the 2020 third quarter operating budget and reserve report. Okay. Please uh, proceed, the staff member who's going to be presenting that. Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, so the 2020 third quarter operating budget and reserve report um, states that as of September 30th, the corporation is forecasting a year-end deficit of $56 million. So this variance represents about 7.4% of the total budgeted expenditures of $753 million. Now, when we factor in the $35 million we've received through phase one, um, that leaves uh, a balance of $20.5 million um, as our variance. So that's what we're expecting um, year end to be. We are hoping and we have applied for phase two funding and expect and anticipate that we will receive additional funds through the safe restart agreement. And hopefully um, that will make us whole for the year 2020. So the announcement of the funding and who will be included uh, is expected by year end from the province. And the, the money is expected to flow early next year. So we'll get that announcement uh, later this year and hopefully understand what's happening by the beginning of next year. From a funding pers a rate stabilization perspective, our GRS is at $69.5 million. So if we don't receive that $20 million from uh, the other levels of government, um, we, would pro we would recommend going to the GRS, which would obviously lower that down to, to about $50 million. In terms of COVID impacts for the year, um, we've had a, we're, we're projecting about $100 million in revenue losses, so quite substantial, uh, largely focused in transit and recreation. We've incurred additional emergency measures costs of $13.5 million, and that has been offset through various operational savings and mitigation measures by $58 million. So, you know, the corporation's really done what, it's can, what, it, what it could to um, offset the significant uh, revenue losses. Um, in addition, you know, Council, the Appendix 2, you can see the departmental variances. So you can see labor, other, and revenue by each department to see where the impacts are. Um, but with that, I'll uh, turn it back to Council for any specific questions. Well, thank you for that um, third quarter update. Given how difficult this year has been, you know, that is encouraging that um, with the second phase of the safe restart agreement, we could actually end up being whole. Um, that's um, good news in what was a financially very challenging year, and it shows how our staff pivoted, whether it was when we adapted to not using seasonal workers in the summer when we weren't allowed to um, have seasonal activities on. I think there was a lot of a lot of um, agility, and and we're going to get through this year financially intact, which is which is an accomplishment. Um, do we need a, a motion to accept this, Peter? I don't see any questions. Yes, just a motion to receive the report as set it, set out in the staff recommendation. Okay, um, maybe moved by myself and Councillor Vicente. Are there anyone opposed to this motion to receive the third quarter operating budget reserve report? 
Hearing none, the motion carries. This takes us, I believe, to staff report, um, capital project financial status report. Yes, uh, th through the chair. So the capital project uh, financial sta uh, status report um, as of September 30th uh, includes 493 active capital projects with total approved budget of $2 billion. So that's what we have on the books right now. Of the $2 billion, 1.2 has been spent as of September 30th, uh, leaving a total of $845 million that is active. Um, of that 845 million, 156 million um, has purchase orders committed against it. So we have vendors allocated, they're working on the initiatives. Um, however, we do have 689 million that has not yet been committed or spent. So to put that into context, we typically spend about 200, 220 million per year. So we have a little bit more than three years of, of work on the books. Uh, uncommitted, unspent. Um, in addition to that, we've been working closely with, with KPMG and, and we'll be seeing their recommendations shortly um, to really re review our, our capital project management and uh, provide recommendations, um, as the CEO indicated, of a project management office to um, further refine our alignment of allocating funding uh, with delivery of capital projects. Mayor Brown, your microphone is muted. Okay, there. Um, is there questions? There are none. Okay, so can we have a motion um, to move this? And maybe Councillor Santos is the chair of community services where there's lots of capital projects and Councillor Williams as the vice chair. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. This takes us to staff report 2021 user fees community service. Can we get the, the next staff report up on the screen, Peter? Charlotte, can you bring up the next staff report, there. please? Okay. So this is the staff report from community services, corporate support services, fire emergency services, legislative services, public works engineering, I believe, right? No? Okay. Oh. There it is. This is the user fees for community services, corporate support services, fire, emergency service, legislative services, and public works and engineering. Is Mark Medeiros presenting this? Uh, sure, through the chair. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this is our annual user fee report for these specific areas. Um, last year, uh, we had provided the, the same report, and obviously before COVID, we had recommended a revenue budget increase through this of 2.1 million. Um, however, given, given the, the impact of COVID, Council had approved uh, financial relief for residents uh, as of May 27th by reverting back the user fees approved in last year's budget to 29 uh, levels. So that, that was done and that was effective. That is effective until December 31st, 2020. So what we are primarily proposing through this report is that the user fees that were approved in last year's 2020 budget be reestablished as of January 1st, uh, 2021, um, and largely, for the most part, keeping every everything status quo for, for that. So not additional increases on top of last year's, except for uh, a few minor um, increases that we've identified uh, through the report. Um, but largely what 
this report is doing is just um, restating that we'll, our, our user fee levels will revert back to what we had approved uh, last year. And, and we do have uh, the appendices um, listing all of the individual reports and um, specific verbiage on the individual increases that we are we are doing. So there are some recreation user fees, some performance arts fees, um, some land title searches, fires increasing a few of their internal and external service provision costs. Um, so we, we, we do have those details here as well. I believe Councillor Pileshi might have a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor. I was just asking the clerk if, um, it, as we move through these recommendations and then motions come out tomorrow, then do we need uh, then two thirds to reopen? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the answer is no. Uh, like previous okay. budget years, um, and I, I said this at the beginning of the session, uh, these are sort of preliminary recommendations and as per past practice, we will bring the comprehensive and full set of recommendations back to budget committee at the end before it adjourns um, to make sure that there's a reconciliation and committee can vote on all the recommendations to bring forward to the special meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no um, questions for this, um, can we have it moved by Councillor Pileshi and Willens, the user fee Guidelines 2021. Simply because Councillor Pleasure was the last person to speak. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. This takes us to 8.4, supporting documentation 2021 proposed operating budget and capital budgets pre budget discussion. So, Mr. Mayor, this, this is information that uh, was requested in uh, pre-budget uh, discussions with individual members and staff have consolidated and reported out. So, unless there's any specific questions, some questions have been addressed and, and brought up throughout uh, the budget sessions to date. Um, this would just be for receipt. Okay. And thank you to all the um, thoughtful questions that councillors put in and the diligent work that staff undertook to answer those um, precisely. Uh, Councillor... Medeiros. Thank you, through you, Mayor, and thank you to staff. Uh, I agree uh, from the CAO and everyone involved. Uh, great job in getting us the information, especially reacting to our questions. Just in addition, I'm not sure if we could just to, to note, but in terms of this part, and Mark Medeiros, maybe you can let me know. Each department, for example, sometimes when they report what the operational is, but for example, when they use consulting services, does that budget get teased out? Do we see exactly for example, how much money is used in each department, uh, because that's a different bucket. And I know, uh, having worked on the budget at the province, there was it was a completely different reporting. So I don't know, again, getting back to how we're reporting it, um, is it the operations, do we have a specific teased out consulting budget that each department uses that will that is uh, reported on? Uh, th through the chair, we have a, a professional services account and the consulting budgets would be captured under that account and the expenditures as well. So every department um, and, and division and cost center would have uh, those that have a, a professional services budget would have a, a dedicated budget and, and expenditures tracked that way through that account. So each department then under professional services, they all have... The, they're all allocated a budget and and that budget is based on what based on their operational plans and where they think they're going to identify consultant services uh that's correct I, I wouldn't say everybody has it but those that have requested it and have put it forward through previous budgets um um do have that and and they have that 
ability to spend um, based on their work plan. And, and each year we we look at the budget versus what has been spent to ensure, for example, that we don't have a budget sitting there that is not being utilized. So, you know, the, the, the budgets are typically closely aligned to expenditure activity, um, but it is up to each department and, and the commissioners and directors to ensure that, you know, the funds are, are, are needed and, and being utilized accordingly. Yeah, and, and thank you very much, Mark, because that's exactly what I was referring, that was exactly one of my concerns, is that, that it's not just a, a year by year uh, ask to ensure that if they need it, but you guys are really tracking to ensure that uh, it, the expenditures really reflect sort of the business lines and the work that they're doing, and it's not just being sort of uh, moved to the, sitting there year by year. So I, I appreciate that in terms of, and I know I've asked for information directly to staff in term, terms of itemized list of all the sort of uh, consultants uh, that we've been used across the year and how much money that each department, whatever the breakdown is. So I'll wait for that. And I thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilor Medeiros. See no other questions. I'll say this motion is moved by Councilor Medeiros, seconded by Councilor Fortini. for the supporting documentation 2021 proposed operating capital budgets pre-budget discussion. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Mr. Mayor, the next report is 8.5, just supporting documentation regarding a summary of the November 12th telephone town hall and other public feedback regarding the budget. And mm -hmm. that is just for information as well. Okay, I'm happy to move that along with Councillor Vicente since we were there in person for the teletown hall. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And Mr. Mayor, that does end the reports. Uh, 8.6 was the report on the driveway headwalls and that was considered on Tuesday evening accompanying the delegation. The next item would be Correspondence. There's a number of pieces of correspondence identified as item 10.1 uh, that have come in since the start of budget, and they're here for the committee's consideration and receipt. Okay. Happy to move those. Is there anyone opposed to receiving the correspondence? Hearing none, the motion carries. Now, I know there's going to be a number of motions that are going to be put forward tomorrow um, and we've got through a lot today now that we've completed all the staff reports and the departmental reports unless council feels otherwise um, I feel that um, uh, we could uh, deal with the remaining business tomorrow when the budget committee um, meets at one o'clock unless anyone has a, um, a burning desire to deal with one of the items um, uh, right now. I know we haven't taken a lunch break, so I'm mindful of that as well. I can hear Councillor Willen's um, stomach grumble from here. I agree with you, Mayor. I agree. Okay, so seeing no uh, opposition. So, Mr. Mayor. Yes. So normally before we do recess, if, if it's the will of committee to recess until tomorrow at one o'clock. Oh, public question period. Yes, of course. We have public question period. And I also want to note that I, the clerk's office has received an email um, from some individuals that are requesting to delegate. They were requesting to delegate tonight, but if committee wishes to add them as a delegation, they can be added tomorrow regarding a sports dome in Brampton, specifically at the Cassie Campbell Recreation Center for field hockey. Um, yeah, why don't we add them as the first delegation tomorrow? Uh, we, we don't need to reconvene um, in the evening just for one delegation. Certainly. So we'll, um, if that's the will of committee, we'll advise them to join the session tomorrow. And we do have one question from public question period. Mm -hmm. And I will raise the question here. It's from Sylvia Menezes Roberts. Uh, council and staff have talked about things such as diversity, equity, and inclusion. As of November 2020, Brampton Transit's data says 40% of bus stops are not accessible. How many of these 1,100 inaccessible bus, bus stops will be made accessible this year? I'm going to see if our transit commissioner can speak to that. Alex, are you on the line? 
Absolutely. Um, through you, Mayor, I'm not sure where the data was uh, acquired from. Uh, I know that uh, approximately 15% of our bus stops are, um, are not accessible. And what that means is if we pour a concrete pad, for example, for a bus stop location, it's conductivity to the sidewalks to make it fully accessible. So approximately 15% uh, is what I understand is not accessible. And we do approximately 15 to 100 uh, stops per year. 15% uh, would be approximately uh, 400 uh, bus stops. Okay. So that, thank you for that answer. So well, on Mr. that Mayor, note, there's, there is nothing else. If uh, the committee wishes, um, if there's consensus right. to re reconvene tomorrow, committee can recess. Okay. Make your call. Seeing no concern about that, then we will we'll, we'll have budget committee reconvene at one o'clock tomorrow. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, that's when we bring all the budget uh, motions in. Yes, please bring your motions for tomorrow. And I, I'm going to ask council just so people if, um, who want to prepare um, and consider motions. Uh, Councillor Pelleschi shared his motion with all the council um, over email, and I, I and I'd suggest if if um, I would encourage if you want to give the, that benefit to your to your colleagues to share the the motions you you plan so they have time to do their own research as they consider the various motions. Well, I think some of us already mentioned some of our motions during the thing. It was just in consideration if we're going to add it or not add it. So, so we'll send it out. Thank you. Okay. And know that the clerk's office is, is available for anyone that needs assistance drafting a, um, uh, a motion. And Peter, thank you and Charlotte for um, the tireless work that you put in during um, budget. Uh, uh, Peter tends to be the person who's there at all hours at City Hall, and we are lucky to have um, his someone as dedicated as, as, as our city clerk. Um, until uh, tomorrow, I thank everyone for your uh, consideration of today.